Hello, good evening. So later than normal stream. I think uh, I think last year when I was doing this a lot, I'm pretty sure I was streaming pretty much every Thursday and Saturday, I think. So now that I'm kind of getting back into the swing of things, I think what I want to do is just do a couple of flights regularly. Try to get uh, some progression in my on-air career, which I've kind of neglected for a bit. Um, and just do them, you know, Potentially in the evening sometimes, and weekends when I don't have plans, stuff like that, and just have something consistent going on because, yeah, definitely uh, the consistency has been the challenge here. So <laughs> even if I'm not making a video, at least I can hop on a stream, do a couple of flights, chat with you guys, hang out for a little bit. So I'm going to give that a shot and see how it goes, see if you guys like that or not. And uh, worst case scenario... Um, People don't like it as much, and uh, and I stop doing it. But at least I'll be making money in my on-air career, so it's it's kind of a win. <laughs> uh, speaking of on-air, they, I swear it's been updating. I I think like every time I open it, there's an update. This week, I think I've opened it a few times, and I think I've had three or four updates um, just this week. It feels like, and it's it's only what Wednesday, um, which is great. So um, I just play on-air as like a solo solo mode you know and um yeah i just have my own my own company with just me in it uh but i play on the thunder server and with on air company the thunder server is kind of like the more realistic server so you can't use ai pilots to do anything um, but then they have other servers where you can like uh you know you can have a whole like a i call it like more like a franchise mode where you can basically run a whole airliner yourself like an airline company um and have like tons of ai pilots flying and you know manage fbos and all that kind of stuff so uh on air is pretty intense it's pretty cool what's up chris what's up kevin hey again deuce how's it going i love you men keep it up all right we'll do <laughs> um i know normally i normally i stream a earlier more like noon pacific time but it's 7 30 here in california right now so it's probably a good thing because not everybody can hang out at you know noon on a saturday especially people with families or wherever you are in the world it's so different so it'd be cool to do something kind of a different a different time here and there so more people can watch or at least different people can watch um all right let's get this started i'm just blabbering on so i have my main plane that I've been using for a bit is the Grand Caravan. You can go back and forth. Like I can sell this and, um, you know, get any plane that I want. But I actually did the CJ did a CJ four for a bit, but I wasn't not very good at flying that. Um, but yeah, if if you guys have used NeoFly, this will look pretty similar to NeoFly. I mean, it's you know, like Sky Park calls it. It doesn't it. It has a spreadsheet interface that's kind of like Sky Park selling point. They're like, oh, no spreadsheet interface. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm just uh, looking for available jobs. We'll find a passenger job, I think. Actually, um, I need to check what I currently have loaded on. I think I have a few passengers already. I think I need to fly to the east like 40 miles. So I, yeah, okay. So, you know, you can get really efficient with how you do these flights. Like you can take multiple jobs at once if you're going in the same direction so at the airport we're currently at uh kdgw this is in wyoming um i forget the name of it let me check the name where we're at is it uh oh it's converse converse co or douglas oh i thought it was at converse uh it's douglas which is this is in wyoming um, so I dropped a few passengers off here and now what I have is, um, I had a bunch of people here going to KLSK, which is to the east a little bit. So if I type that in, we can just get a preview. Yeah, it's only 50 miles to the east. So this is Lusk. I think this is also in Wyoming. So I'll start with this shorter flight. We'll take the rest of these passengers there. So it looks like I have some aviation parts computing equipment and then i have five passengers four musicians and a student on board so they're all already loaded up 
All right, so I'm going to hop over. So we're, we're going KDGW to KLSK. I'm going to go use trusty sim brief to do this. Let me make sure I got that right. KDGW, Delta Golf Whiskey to Lima Sierra Kilo. Delta Golf Whiskey, Lima Sierra Kilo. A uh, Kilo, Kilo. And then airframe, I can choose my 208. Um, I actually have this one put in with my current, that's current tail number on the one that I'm flying. Because when you rent one, you actually have, uh, you know, it gives you a pre-generated tail number. So I'm not flying the uh, 22 Kilo India Papa. I think what I need to do is uh, if I keep this going and I'm doing this a couple times a week, I obviously need to graduate to doing uh, ATC. It's a little uh, a little scary just because using like VATSIM or Pilot Edge along with reading chat and streaming live, it's kind of a lot, but we'll see. Maybe uh, that's what I aspire to do. Okay, this is a really easy route. We're just going to a single waypoint, India, India, Papa. So we're hitting up just a VOR nearby Douglas Airport, and then we're going east to Lusk. And what's really good about using SimBrief, especially with uh, especially with the on-air company, is on-air company and NeoFly, you have to manage your fuel, and SimBrief gives you your block fuel when you generate the flight plan, so we'll know how much fuel we need, including reserve fuel time to make the flight. Straubs, <laughs> student of hard knocks. <laughs> exactly. I've uh, only I'm only streetwise with flight sims. I have no uh, since I'm not a real pilot. All right, so here we get our block fuel, 854 pounds. So that is not much at all. We already have. Let's see our fuel weight right now. All right, we have 776 pounds right near now. We need 854. So I'm just gonna bring us up to a little more than 854. Let's just go to 900. And I don't want to fill too much because mattering our next flight, I don't know what next job we're going to take at the next airport. And so we may need to have less fuel in, right? So we can have more uh, more capacity for our payload. So we can take more passengers or we can take more cargo or something like that on a shorter flight instead of just maxing this out. If I max this out, we're not going to have as much, uh, as much capacity for passengers and cargo on the next flight. So I'll only put in as much fuel as I need for this flight. And then something that else that I have is this is set to minus eight hours. So this is going to automatically set the time of the sim backwards eight hours. And since I tend to fly at nighttime in real world time in the US, uh, I do this usually just to not always be flying at nighttime because <laughs> after work and after dinner or whatever, if you only got a few hours to fly, it can be really annoying to uh, always be in just darkness the entire time. All right, so we got our fuel and we're going to program this in manually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of our destination airport. We're just going to load right in at parking. And then I'm going to reset this backwards about eight hours. It'll do it automatically for us once we start the flight in on air company. But I'm going to bring it back just because uh, I don't want to see the abrupt change from nighttime to daytime when I click the button. All right, so everything's loaded in. We have a good uh, 1,600 pounds left over. And we're going to drop off all the cargo and the five passengers over at this next airport at Lusk. All right, and then I'm going to hit start tracking right up here because once we do that, it's going to... It, it basically expects us to start cold and dark every time. All right, cool. So we're tracking now. So we're good to go there. Unlike, um, unlike with Sky Park, I actually remember to start my flights here. All right, let's use the checklist and get this started. All right, beacon on. I actually have a switch for... Oh, no, my switch is for my strobe. Never mind. Uh, and actually, I'm running the latest update. So there was an update earlier today for Microsoft Flight Sim on the beta. So if you're in Sim Update 10 beta... There's a new update that came out with a bunch of bug fixes. Actually, just to be paranoid, let me check my own stream and make sure my mic is on. Switch for... It uh, is. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the last time when I, I started it up and we, I had no microphone for 15 minutes or whatever again. Uh, I'm just paranoid about doing that again. 
Um, so the update had a bunch of NXI fixes as well. Um, one of them, I think there was a VNAV fix. Um, I remember I had a few times where I was using VNAV and it didn't uh, capture my altitude that was selected on a descent or like a uh, final approach fix. That happened to me a couple times. I'm hoping that's fixed. Yeah, don't forget my cargo. Yeah, luckily with this, unlike with Sky Park, I remember because I don't know. There's something about on air and Neofly, especially on air. I just take it a little more seriously, um, and I know that I'll get penalized if I don't start the tracking right away. Because at, at least on the Thunder server, which is kind of like the hardcore mode, um, if you you get penalized if you start the tracking, you already have your lights on or your engines on. It's supposed to be cold and dark at parking as soon as you start. All right, just moved my my levers here to make sure that we're in low idle and our RPMs are maxed out. So prop is full forward. And we're at idle, so now we just need to program this. So let's go over. The first thing I'm going to do... Oh, did I turn it off by accident? Oh, no, I killed the engine. So what happened was this on my, my hardware here on my throttle quadrant was here. These were all zeroed out. So what I need to do is I use the assisted checklist instead of doing it manually. So I just reset those by accident. So I'm going to redo the starting engine checklist, reset autocomplete page. Hey, Jacob, just started using the NeoFly beta and I love it. Yeah, yeah. NeoFly is, I think, NeoFly is incredible. On Air is the most expensive, number one. It is a subscription service. So... Especially if you, if you go month to month in on-air company, it's going to cost you like 10 bucks a month or something like that, which is pretty crazy. But if you like it and you pay in advance, like I just resubscribed. I had a year that I paid for that was like 35 bucks for an entire year. I just resubscribed for two years and I think it was about 50 to 55 US dollars. So that's giving me two years for 55 bucks. And I think part of it is because they have like a multiplayer component. It's all stored in the cloud. You can actually like in bed, lay down and open your tablet to go to their website and manage your fleet of planes. Or if you're doing the one where you like own your own airliner with all sorts of pilots and you hire AI pilots and run it like a franchise kind of style, um, you can do all that on your laptop or like on a tablet, um, you know, using the, using the website. So there's just, it's a, it's a very complex version of neofly basically and it has like virtual airlines and all that kind of stuff like if you look up here there i could apply for a virtual airline and play on a team basically you know be in a virtual airline with a bunch of other real world pilots or you know real world meaning humans actual other humans um yeah and you know the people that run these virtual airlines can manage them manage their pilots they have to purchase the planes they have to rent the planes you have to you can manage fbo's you can do a lot of that stuff in Neofly as well. But anyway, to answer your question, um, I guess that is answering your question. How does it compare? Neofly is free, which is the best part about it. And Neofly has the most variety in the mission types. They have search and rescue and like helicopter VIP stuff. On air, they're adding a bunch, but I mean, generally I'm just doing cargo and passengers. They'll have different subcategories like fragile cargo um, and things like that. I think Neofly though, like if you want to have have like a lot of fun, especially with helicopters, I would do Neofly. I mean, it's free. You can't you can't go wrong. But yeah, I think um, the biggest difference besides the price is Neofly is great for a single pilot. On Air Company is great if you want to do the virtual airlines and and if you care, it's nerdy. But if you care about having your stuff backed up online, I lost my Neofly profile. I lost my whole progress on it. When I uh, reformatted, my, reformatted my hard drive, I forgot to back it up. So I just kind of lost everything. It was my mistake, but I don't have to think about that with on air, which is nice. All right, let's finally program this in. Oh, that bug is so weird. For some reason, when I click it the first time, it zooms my camera out, even though I've reset all my hotkeys. Um, okay, our origin is our current airport, KDGW, KDGW. Don't know the runway yet, but I'll add that in a minute. Um, I usually do the destination first. I know the flight plane is only one thing and we have no procedures, so. And then let's double check our destination, KLSK. 
Lima, Sierra, Kilo. Okay, hit enter on that. And whoops, click first and then hit enter because I was using keyboard mode. No runway there either. And then our flight plan is really simple. We're just going over here to this waypoint. This is a VOR, India, India, Papa. So we're going to put that in IIP. Using keyboard entry mode just by clicking the field here. And that's it. And it's giving us an estimated altitude of 4,800 already. Check over here. They have us cruising 8,000 feet. So we're going to assume 8,000 feet for now. I'm actually going to put... Um, Let's see, we're going eastbound. Let's put in 7,500 for now. And then once we get in touch with ATC, because uh, this is an untowered airport, once we get our IFR clearance, we'll go up to 8,000, assuming they assign us 8,000. Hey, Nick, what's up? Do the career mode mods allow payware aircraft? Yes. Uh, pretty much all of them do. Neofly, um, they do. Uh, I was using the Kodiak uh, in this like a few months back, so you definitely can. Um, if you go up here, let's see, for on air, on air is probably the most thorough. They update it constantly just because they support every sim. Uh, you can use X Plane. That's it's another benefit of on air, actually, is if you happen to use X Plane or Prepared and Microsoft Flight Simulator, if you use multiple sims, you can go back and forth. I could just jump into X Plane and fly my same plane. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't do that anymore, but for those of you that still use X-Plane or you're looking forward to X-Plane 12, you can not worry about changing SIM and losing everything. Um, it's kind of a theme with on-air. You just kind of, it's kind of persistent. Uh, but yeah, if you go up to aircraft, Elon Musk, hey Elon, what's up? Uh, is this online? So, it doesn't inject multiplayer traffic, but it's it it does have a multiplayer map, but it, it doesn't inject the traffic. So like if I go to the multiplayer map, you can see other on air users right now. So like here's a guy to my east flying. So all these little icons are people flying using on air. Um, I don't know if it shows everyone or not. Yeah, and show all airports show employees anyway um it's only online in the sense that everything in on air like in the app <clears throat> you can you can buy a plane or rent a plane from another on air user but you don't see each other flying together that would be so cool if you could do that though i mean that maybe they maybe they're planning on doing that at some point that would be incredible um, okay, so we got the flight plan program in KDGW, IIP, KLSK, and let's go ahead and check the METAR really quickly, and I'm actually going to use Navigraph today. I, I tend to use ForeFlight, but I don't really want to share my iPad and stuff like that. It's a little complicated on the stream. Navigraph having the in-game panel like this is awesome. Elon, send us all a million bucks. <laughs> yeah. um, but what's really nice about Navigraph charts is, you know, they have this in-game panel. So if you fly in VR, this is awesome. So I'm going to hit load flight plan and it'll also detect your in-sim flight plan. So it just detected what we put in here on the NXI and it just loaded it in. So we can see uh, direct to IP, direct to KLSK and we're good. So we can have our high or low. Well, we're going to be low on route here. So we can see we're flying down here and then to the east. So what I can do is just go ahead and click on our departure airport, can click on the charts list, and I can open up our taxiway diagram and get the width here. Let's close the sidebar. Oh, whoops. Let's try that again. Um, there we go. I can, oh yeah, I can pin it at the bottom too. I don't actually use Navigraph that often because I'm using ForeFlight all the time, but Navigraph is if you wanna, if you wanna, if you're willing to throw down like a hundred dollars for the year, it's also a subscription, like on air, and that stuff can add up. But um, it's it's pretty amazing. You get global Jefferson charts. It has moving map for everything. So yeah, here we can just see our current position on the taxiway. All right, and then also yeah, what well, we need are our, we need our com frequencies. So if I go to references, oh, there are no charts for it. All right, let's just look at, oh yeah, we have it right here on the taxiway diagram, 135.225. Trying to do some of this manually just to kind of get myself in the that headspace of 
you know, the future of using Vatsim potentially. You have to do all this stuff manually in Vatsim. Uh, Texas speech is offline. Okay. All right, so we're going to listen for our... Uh, listen here for our... Oh, I missed the wind already. All right, no clouds. Hey, <laughs> Philip. All right, 3009, so... Let's listen for the wind again. Figure out which runway we want. Zero one two at eight eight knots. All right, so runway zero five is the closest to zero one, so we're gonna take that. All right, and it does it does matter whether it's um I think this is this is an ASOS ASOS, so it's an automated weather service like water uh, automated what is it surface surface observation system or something like that, and um I know there's a difference between if it's ATIS and it's recorded by a human, they will read the wind in magnetic direction. Whereas if it's generated by a computer, like a METAR is, it will actually be in true heading instead of magnetic heading. Um, but luckily in this case, it, at zero one, you know, if we had runway one, that would be great. But in this case, we have runway five, that's going to be closest. And we can take a look at the windsock as we're taxiing to make sure that it's good. All right, so we keep the taxiway diagram up. Um, we're already tracking an on-air company. Turn our taxi light on. Our strobe is on. Let's turn our nav light on. And we're good. All started up. Our fuel is loaded because on-air company manages your fuel for you automatically. So this fuel that we have here is actually the amount we have in on-air. It also manages your weight for you as well. So uh, as soon as I hit track, it actually loaded the plane with the passenger's weight and everything. All right, so parking brake off and let's uh, taxi over to runway five. We can see runway five is over here. The only way to get there is uh, to get to the threshold of the runway, we're gonna have to be on the runway. And um, so we're either gonna go on this taxiway here towards alpha two, then alpha to alpha one, and then to runway five. We'll just do it that way. We're already aiming that direction anyway, so this will be just fine. And what we can do on this flight, we'll see the NXI had some updates today as well as the sim in general. Um, actually, one of the, the sim updates that happened today or bug fixes that happened today said something about communication frequencies being lost at like a certain uh, megahertz, a certain um, decimal point megahertz issue. So like it tuned into the wrong spacing or something like that with the frequency. Now I'm actually wondering if in the last stream that's what happened. Um, because basically it made it so we couldn't tune into anything else. And it was related to using the ATC window. So uh, it's possible that that's the bug I ran into last time when I wasn't able to get our clearance for our second flight. But uh, Deuce, who's in chat that flew along with us, he was able to get his. So anyway. Hey, K2, what's up? All spoken winds, robot or human are magnetic. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So the... So if it's right, okay. If it's spoken, it's magnetic. If it's written, it's true, right? So even if it's computer generated, all right. Um, I didn't, hey Mike, uh, I chose the gravel one just because the winds are gonna be favorable there. The winds are at uh, at a zero one zero. It's only four knots. I guess my second option would have been two nine maybe. Um, and yeah, I don't mind that it's gravel. We only need like 2,200 feet or so for our takeoff roll if we do short field with the Grand Caravan. So 4,700 feet is plenty. This is an untowered airport in Wyoming. And um, thankfully though, both of these runways are super long. And we're the Grand Caravan. So yeah, gravel's no problem. We could take off in grass and dirt and all that. I know the Kodiak is like superior. <laughs> if you want, you want like a... Short takeoff and landing. Hope the passengers agree. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point actually, because you do get comfort. There are comfort ratings and things like that when you fly using on air. So they'll ding you for everything, like your bank angle, uh, your G's when you're turning, um, your your feet per minute rate when you're descending and landing, all that stuff. So we'll see how it goes. It's a good point. Um, except a transcribed ATIS, I think those are still magnetic. Oh, got it, got it. 
So basically, at least for now, I, I should assume a METAR is true and probably everything else is magnetic. All right, so this is the start of runway five here. Let's open my ATC window. You know, it doesn't really matter if we do the ATC stuff. Oh, I didn't even announce my taxi, so yeah. Clearly, I'm not uh, paying too much attention. And let's see, we're departing to the south, I would say. Kilo Delta Golf Whiskey traffic <laughs> in November 2, 2 Kilo India Papa taking off runway 5 south. The, uh, the text to speech is offline right now with Microsoft, so this is uh, <laughs> it's giving us the hilarious sounding default offline voices. All right, landing light is on since we're getting on the runway. Can't really see out this way too well. I don't see anybody. All right, so we're gonna taxi up all the way up to the start of the runway here and we're gonna have to make a hard U-turn. All right, while we're taxiing a little more, let me get my autopilot set up here. So we're gonna go to 7,500 first until we can get our IFR clearance. Flight level change. Our VY, so our best rate of climbs, 95 in the Grand Caravan. I'm gonna do a little faster. Let's just do 100, and we'll use heading mode, and that'll be right behind us. Sync the heading bug. We're 238. The reciprocal 058. Change it to 058. We'll sync it again once I turn around. All right, and I just need to remember to put it into high idle. Turning our taxi light off. Landing light is still on. This is gonna be a tight U-turn up here. This is just a, it's a long runway, but it's not super wide. Got our birds in front of us. That's one of the other add-ons I have. I don't think I put it in the description where I list the add-ons, but it's like, oh, what's the name of the, Forget the name of the developer, but they're, um, you can add birds, at least in the US. I don't know if they've done Europe yet. The downside of the birds is you have to pay for them regionally. So there, I think there's like four or five that cover the US. And that's just because um, what they do is put different birds in different areas. But it's, co it's cool to see them. Thankfully, you can't collide with them. All right, high idle is set for our fuel condition. All right, let's sync the heading bug straight ahead. And then I actually didn't, I forgot to check the departure procedures here. So we're on runway zero five. It says to climb to 5,200 feet. So let's do that. Uh, minimum climb at 271 feet per nautical mile to 5,200 feet. 55, 52. Wait, 5,200 feet. We're, we're at 4,900 feet. Yeah, that does not look like gravel at all, right? You know what it probably is? I have um, I have another mod called Enhanced Airport Graphics. And what that mod does is replace all the runway. So you can see all like the rubber markings and stuff on this one. Is this gravel? Maybe it is gravel. I don't know. I mean, it's not, it, it does look a bit too nice. All right, let's go full throttle. And we'll have a little bit of wind from our left side, so I'm giving it a little left aileron until we get faster. All right, we're at 40 knots, 50 knots. We take off at 70 in the Grand Caravan. There's 70, a little bumpy. Sorry, passengers. All right, I'm pulling back on the throttle since we're red lines here on our torque. I should review the POH on the Grand Caravan again. I don't know if redlining is okay on takeoff. Like how, how long I can uh, keep the torque in the red for. Or if that's even accurate that it would be in the red then. I'll have to look that up. All right, we're over 500 AGL. All right, turning the autopilot on so I can bring up the ATC window. 
And then we're going to turn our heading bug around here. Let me turn that music down. I never know how loud it's going to be. Alright, uh, so what we can do now is, since we took off Untowered Airport, we're taking off VFR. What we can do, and this is a Sim Update 10 thing, that's the best thing in Sim Update 10 in the NXI is ATC syncing. So the map, our flight plan synchronizes with the Microsoft Flight Sim ATC. So we can contact Denver Center and we can get our IFR clearance. I don't know if this is a bug or it'll be changed, but for now we have to do flight following Denver first, Center and after this is done, then we can get our IFR clearance. Alright, I'm in a arm nav mode, so that's ready. Oops, y'all damper on. Alright, 6577 on the transponder. And I had it off. That was another mistake already. It wasn't I, I didn't have VFR. Altimeter three zero zero nine. Yeah, the voices are great. All right. So once we acknowledge this, it'll give us the option to request our IFR clearance. Unfortunately, we can't do it right now until we get the flight following. Um, so we're at our seventy five hundred foot VFR altitude right now. All right, GPS mode is activating, so that's going to turn us left onto course. And we're leveling off at 7,500 feet. All right, so now, hopefully, we'll see if this can get changed, but when you're untowered, you got to do flight following first, then you can request IFR clearance, so we're going to do that now. It's a pretty short flight anyway. Let's see, it says we only have uh, 43 miles, and it's estimated we'll be there in about 16 minutes. All right, that's our current squawks, squawks a quick squawk, squawk code. So we'll just read that back. Yep, three zero zero nine. All right. So they said they said to follow heading 130, but then they said proceed on course. We're already on course. That's always a little confusing. Climb maintain 9,000 feet, so we're going to climb to 9,000. Turning and following heading 130, proceed on course, climb and maintain 9,000 feet, Cessna 72 Delta. Cessna 72 Delta, you are 40. The voices are so funny with offline mode. It's a bummer. Hey Vishal, yeah, that's correct. Did not do the flight plan in the in the world map. So with Sim Update 10, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, with the NXI at least. All right, acknowledge assign approach. So they're giving us visual for 28. They said to expect vectors, but vectors are always a little weird uh, with flight sim, Microsoft Flight Sim ATC. They don't always give you vectors. Usually, sometimes they'll give you one vector. Um, and that's enough, but like if it's a longer approach, so they won't give you multiple vectors, even if there's terrain and stuff, they're not gonna vector you around more than just one time. I know that they're gonna be working on that, so I like to just load in the visual 2A here on the NXI, I'm gonna hit enter, and I'm gonna choose straight every time just because it's better to have something shown than nothing. So even if we were getting vectored for an ILS, I'll always choose a, for, uh, like an initial approach fix just so we always have something available in case we need it. Because otherwise you're just flying blind almost, right? You're just gonna get a final approach course drawn out for you and you're gonna have to listen for the vectors. And if you don't get them, especially with Microsoft Flight Sim ATC, um, then you know it's just better to have, have the option to use these waypoints if I want to. So I'm gonna just load them in. What we also get is all the VNAV altitudes. Now, these are just advisory because it's a visual approach. Visual approach doesn't give you any obstacle clearance guarantees at all, unlike a instrument approach does. So here we just have a couple that are calculated by the Garmin based on the elevation of the airport and a, just a standard three degree flight path angle you can see down here. So we can use VNAV and we can get like a basically a fake glide slope to go down uh, towards the runway as well. So we'll play around with that once we get closer. But that's all dialed in and we're 500 feet we have 500 feet to go. I'm going to get that going a little bit faster. Let's go to 130 on our flight level change speed. We get up to 9,000.
Oh, are the old offline voices worse? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Vishal, the, the good thing about the beta, so the beta comes out next month. It'll come out uh, about four weeks from now. I think it's on the 23rd of August. Um, but if you want to get the beta now, which is what I'm using, you can get it on Xbox and PC. All you have to do is um, download the Microsoft Insider Hub app, and then you just opt into the beta, and then that'll let you update your SIM to the beta version. And you can always opt out and update to you know go back to the current uh, SIM update 9 version. But so far, it's been pretty stable, I would say. I um, The last stream, it was freezing a bit when I started like when I was doing a bunch of stuff on the world map. Um, I'm not sure if that was fixed in today's update or not, but in general, it's been, it's just been pretty stable for me. So where I am right now is in Wyoming with my career mode here with the on-air. So um, we're just, we just got a lot of clear skies here. You can fly with real weather or real time if you want. I'm always on real weather. Um, but you can also tell it to change your offset, have an offset for the time for you. So it'll keep the weather live and it'll just change the time of day. So I usually do that just so I get uh, some daylight flying in when it's actually nighttime in the real world. And then you can see our tail number here, 72 Delta. So this is you know a unique tail number in on air. So this plane has that tail number. And if I stop renting, I'm renting this plane right now because to buy it in on-air, it's like it's like $2 million or something. Um, I'd have to check the price, but I'm still renting it. So I pay, you know, per, is it per hour? Uh, I have like a million dollars saved up in my bank in on-air. So yeah, it's, uh, I'm not at risk of losing the plane or not being able to pay for it. Uh, any chance of it saving filters? I don't think that's been in the release notes, unfortunately. And um, I think we talked about that on the last stream, and there were there are some options to download mods for that. But uh, yeah, that would be really nice. All right, we're doing a good 150 knots. We got a little bit of a we got a little crosswind going here from the left. See, so we got 42.9 miles left. And it looks like it'll take us about 15 minutes. All right, so let's use Navigraph here. Let's grab the, see the weather. If there's a weather comm frequency available over here. Okay, yeah, there's an AWOS. Oops. AWOS at 118.350. So let's go ahead and Put that in our COM2 radio. God, that's the weirdest bug. Whenever I push a knob, it zooms my camera out. Or it only happens like the first time. I don't, I don't really know why it's doing that. Uh, okay, let's go 11835. All right, 350. And then, so I've activated that here in our com, for our COM2 radio and I can just listen by clicking COM2 right here. So they put us at runway 28. All right. Two nine nine two. So standard for the altimeter. We're at three zero zero nine right now, but that's what ATC gave us. So we're gonna keep that going. All right. So I just hit COM two again to stop listening. So this is just a. In general, this is a good way to use your COM2 radio for monitoring. Um, I think if you're on VATSIM, do they have a guard frequency on VATSIM? I think on Pilot Edge they do, and like in real life, I think I think how it goes is that optionally, but it's a good thing to monitor like the, I think it's called guard, which is basically like a unicom frequency, like a global unicom frequency, just in case um, pilots need to communicate with each other, I think is what it's for. Anyway, somebody can educate me. But I know there's there's something to do with monitoring another frequency that's for emergencies. So if you're another pilot, you just keep that monitoring um, on your COM2 radio if, if you can. Uh, Vishal says, if you have COM1 and 2 enabled, would you hear both at once? Yeah, you would. Um, in the sim, it would be really nice if it separated them, like one in your left ear and one in the right ear. But it doesn't do that. It's, they're both in stereo in the sim, so they just uh, they just collide with each other. But yeah. 
Um, if I leave them both on, then yeah, COM1 will override COM2. You'll hear, hear both things. It'll be pretty hard to distinguish them though, both, both being in both ears. Um, but yeah, it does do that. All right, and let me, just out of curiosity, let's see what we got for charts over here at our destination. Okay, it has no charts. Runway information. Oh, it keeps jumping out like that. All right, we have 5,000 feet on both runways. Let's see if we can figure out what type they are. So we have Navigraph going, which is great, but obviously not everybody has Navigraph. So if you don't, oh yeah, there is some, uh, there was some updates to the VFR map today. So some of the bugs got fixed. So if you don't have Navigraph, or even if you do, the VFR map is a lot more useful now. Um, you can just click on anything to get information about it. Oh yeah, the ILS info was added this this update today too. So we'll have to see that later if we uh, get an ILS approach or an airport that has an ILS approach. So you can just click on any waypoint to get info about it. Um, so there's if it's a VOR, you can click and get the frequency. For an airport, you get the elevation, the runway information. So we see we have two concrete runways here, 5,000 feet each, so we're good there. And the frequencies, so we have AWOS and what is FSS flight services, right? So we could call that. I don't know if you can actually use FSS in the sim to like uh, get inform airport information or get a flight plan or weather info, stuff like that. I don't think you can. Uh, and then the tower frequency. So, oh, there's actually a tower at this one. All right. Uh, 122.8. So I'm going to go ahead and put 122.8 in our standby up here. So we don't have to do that once we get closer. All right, so we're on 1356, that's with Denver Center, and then we'll switch over to 1228. And let's see if we can see the, the bug fixes here. So uh, one of the bug fixes was that if you, yep, it, they didn't have the scroll bar, so the scroll bar is back now. So before I was making this really big to see um, to see the whole list, but you can make it more compact now. I think if it's really compact, it just, yeah, makes it almost like a full screen kind of pop-up situation like this, which is really cool. Oh yeah, and this is new too. They added the range indicator in the bottom left, so it shows what range we're zoomed in or out to. That's really cool. So yeah, and then, yeah, the scroll bar is working now, so if you need to scroll down to see, here's the ILS info. It shows the um, ILS that's available. It shows the final approach course, so th 032. It shows the identifier code. And then it shows the frequency for the localizer. All right, they're yelling at me. What do they say? All right, descent to maintain 7,000. Let's do that. 7,000, vertical speed mode. We're at 180 knots, so 180 times 5 is what? I'm going to use my calculator. 900 feet per minute. So if you do your ground speed times five, that gives you like a rough three degree angle of descent. I'm gonna pull back on my throttle here to make sure we don't overspeed. It's pretty unforgiving if you overspeed. <laughs> um, I may or may not have been flying this same exact route last night and didn't pull my throttle back and just instantly got a black screen. So they're having us descend and we're pretty close to the airport at this point. We're at, all right, 26 miles. It feels a lot closer than it is actually. <laughs> Performance and VFR map looks improved. Yeah, I have a bunch of windows open still. I mean, we have Navigraph charts kind of open and minimized as well. Yeah, the zooming, is, the zooming seems better. I remember when I was trying to zoom last time, it was just stuttering a bit. Yeah, this is pretty nice. All right, so I haven't activated the approach because they said they were going to vector us, but I might just break off in a minute. All right, we're at 7,000 feet, or sorry, we're 1,000 away from 7,000 feet. 7,800 and descending. They haven't given us an updated altimeter, have they? They have not, and since we listened to the the AWOS over here, we know that the altimeter is much different. It was standard before. So I think I'm going to change it because we're getting close to the airport. Visibility, 
Alright, it's 2992. Now, one thing we can't do yet is like a, an offset. If we could do an offset, we could basically line up with a runway more precisely. Like if we were doing, um, like say we use OBS mode to line up to have the runway like extended center line drawn out for us. Uh, we could, I haven't seen this because I only know what's in the sim, but supposedly there's a feature called uh, like a track offset. So you can basically say, just fly, you know, two miles or a mile and a half, you know, offset from the course that's programmed in. So we could basically parallel the runway precisely and use autopilot for that. So we'll see, we'll see if we see that in the future. I don't know how complicated that is or if that's even doable. The runway is right in front of us, isn't it? Yep, there it is right there. So as you can see, um, they have not vectored us at all. They haven't said anything and we're pretty much at the airport. So it's gonna turn off autopilot here. We're gonna make our right turn ourselves. So there's our super long runway right there. 5,000 feet to work with. So yeah, if ATC could be improved later to, to be able to vector us in, I think it just has an issue. I mean, it's, it's actually really good at instrument approaches, like uh, giving altitude call outs, you know, telling you when to switch over to the tower and all of that. But as soon as you get towards like a smaller airport, it just seems to kind of fall apart a little bit. And it's not, it's also not showing that there's a tower frequency available, even though Navigraph said that there was a tower frequency. So I'm just gonna keep it kind of extended here. I'm gonna go a little further out just to be safe. Cause I'm not super good at the Grand Caravan. I'm all right when I'm coming in on a straight in, but you want me to fly a pattern, I'm a little more scared. <laughs> ATC feels like it keeps getting better. Oh yeah, I have, I have no doubt it's gonna keep getting improved. Um, whoops, yaw damper's still on, let me turn that off. I have no doubt it's gonna keep getting improved, but um, um, yeah, for now, this is just how it is. And what was our VNAV altitude? It was 5,300. I think the airport was like 58, uh, 40, oh, sorry, not 58, the pattern would be around 58. 59. All right, so 49 for the airport elevation. I wonder why. We will not be doing that. All right, we're at 6,400 feet. Just gonna pretty much go idle here. We need to lose about a thousand feet. And I'm using my smart camera button. I use this pretty often when I'm getting near an airport just because I don't have track IR or anything like that. So instead of just looking directly left and right with my hat, I like to use uh, the smart camera button. When it's working, it's really nice because it'll look at your destination. So it just gives you, when I keep it held down to it, it just gives you a kind of like mimics where your head would be turning and looking, which is pretty nice. And if you fly on little grass strips or anything like that, it's also really nice just because it'll help you find those runways that are really hard to find. I'm just gonna just gonna reply even though we don't we're not gonna climb. They want us to climb even though we're at our destination here. Oh, there we go. All right, I think it's number two to report the runway in sight. 
I know, it's just... Okay, we gotta do this first. Oh, we got a little wind out of the right. We have 15 knots right now. Fifty-seven hundred feet or a bit high. Oh, there is a tower. Wait, what? How is there a tower all of a sudden? Maintain present heading and altitude. Tower on one two two decimal eight Cessna seven two delta. Contact tower. Cleared visual runway two eight approach Cessna seven two delta. Cessna 7 2 Delta, wind calm, cleared to land runway 2 Wind calm? Cleared to land runway 2 8 Cessna. We have 9 knots Delta. from the right. Alright, maybe it's calmed right down there. Maybe not. It is bumpy. I'm gonna miss this, aren't I? I'm way too high. Or it looks like we're going around. That was confusing. I'm gonna go around and make another pass. This is we're just way too high. I am way too high. What is that thing when uh, when you, when it's a bad thing you say we, when it's a good thing you say I? Actually, can you even say going around? Oh yeah, there we go. Tower Cessna November Tree Five Seven Two Delta is going missed. Cessna Seven Two Delta contact Denver Center on One Tree Five Decimal Six. Oh no, not Good Denver day. Center again. One tree five decimal six for Cessna seven two delta. All right, I'm gonna sync my heading bug. Altitude mode on. Altitude hold on. And turn on autopilot so I can do this stuff. Denver Center Cessna November tree five seven two delta. Yeah, I was way too high. I wanted to just like chop and drop. I I didn't even have the ability to. Cessna seven two delta, you are one mile To go straight down and make that. Oh, they're having us go to the opposite runway now. Alright, let's load one zero. Said vectors, we're gonna say straight. Alright, we're just flying runway heading for now. Did they give us an altitude? They said maintain. Alright, I don't again I don't trust them to give us vectors, so it's cool to see it redrawing the path as we're getting further and further from the airport. That's cool. Alright, how far out are we? Are we really 12.5 miles already? Wow, okay. All right, attempt number two. We're at, we're at 6,200 feet now, so I'm gonna pull on, pull up some throttle out here, stop our ascent. Slow to slow speed. We're at 110, so I can pull the flaps whenever we're ready. And I, I want to get lined up a bit sooner than I did last time. That wind was... I mean, I know they updated the wind dynamics, too, so I think I'm definitely still getting used to those. It's just a lot more drastic than I think it's ever been, which is awesome. I mean, it makes it more challenging and probably more realistic. I see the light there at the airport. All right, we're at 62. Still need to drop about a thousand feet.
Overshot it again. All right, we're fine. We'll get lined up here. All right, so now our wind's out from the left. 13 knots from the left here. I don't even know what's going on with the ATC, actually. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, they didn't tell us to climb. They said to maintain. Oh, they said to maintain. Yeah, but we've already turned around. Our speed is getting really low here. We're at 70, we should be more like 80. <laughs> I think 70 is within the acceptable range, but. Floating a little bit. All right, not the smoothest, but I'll take it. <laughs> we're all right. Well, I'm glad I went around the first time because that was we were way, way too high the first time. All right, let's check the airport diagram. Yeah, we're gonna have to turn around and back taxi on this one too. <laughs> turn ATC off. Yeah, I can't help it. I, you know, I want something. I think it's just so quiet if you don't have any kind of ATC on. So even though, you know, the, the Microsoft Flight Sim one has its flaws, at least it's for me, it's better than silence, I think. All right, we're on low idle again. Be cool if on Navigraph it would like do like what ForeFlight does, like bring up your diagrams automatically. Oh, there are no diagrams for this. That's right, there are no diagrams for this airport in Navigraph. All right, low idle is on. I'll just turn my taxi light on a little early. Bring the flaps up. All right, so we're dropping off what five passengers, some plane parts, some computer parts. We didn't even get uh, permission to land. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. Like they just when they don't know our position, they're not gonna. They didn't, you know, transfer us back to the tower. They just don't know what's happening. I guess I could have manually switched over to the tower, maybe. All right. Hey, crack it! I love your avatar. How did you create it? I I paid somebody on Etsy, actually, one of the artists there that does like emojis and badges and all that stuff. Uh, Vatsim, yeah, I'm not quite ready for that yet. I did do Pilot Edge. I've done Pilot Edge a couple times to learn the basics. Man, we can't, we're just stuck in here. Where are we supposed to park? And the wingspan on this thing is just Pretty insane. All right, we're just gonna have to cut through a truck, I guess. Yeah, where is the tower? Good question. I'm sure, our wings are going through the fuel. Oh, we're very close. All right, this looks. This is where they want us. Where this dude is. All right, that's totally safe. If there was collision, it would just be game over every time I hop in the sim. It's a rental, okay? I'm going to be hard on the brakes. It's fine. Alright, there we go. 
All right, so uh, I do have to shut off the engine for um, on air to recognize that we've gotten here. Let's do that. All right, let's see what we did here. Landing rate point, what meters per second? Landing G's 1.01, 72 knots in the green. I don't know what point negative 0.93 meters per second is in feet per minute. But that seems really low, right? Is that like three or four? No way, it's that low. Isn't a meter like three feet? Um, engines on. Oh, this is the time that the engines were on. Airborne. We weren't airborne for six minutes. Oh, what time? These are all the times. Okay. And then our flight time. All right. So anyway, comfort bonus. We got safety bonus not obtained. I wonder why that was because, oh, lights except for the beacon were on at engine shutdown. So these are all of the little rules I have to remember again with on air company, especially on this, this version I'm playing basically this server. And I didn't get the aircraft handling bonus either. So I think if you, if I did maybe less steep turns or did maybe the missed approach counted against me, um, lights were on at engine shutdown. So if you don't turn all the lights off before you, except for the beacon. So all these, uh, all my, like my strobe, my taxi and landing lights were still on. So it penalized me for that. All right, that's fine. But we earned some XP. As you level up in on air, you get um, different capabilities. Like you can open an FBO, or you can get uh, you know loans and things like that. And then it also um, you can see it's ticking down the airframe wear and tear, the engine wear and tear. You have to pay to maintain those things. So if we, I don't know what the hours are right now, but it tracks the like thousand hour maintenance and all that stuff. All right. And we got paid 1.1 million in current cash. I can't, I don't think I can afford to buy a plane yet. I mean, I could buy something smaller, but I really want to use the Grand Caravan still just because, yeah, you know, it's got a lot of cargo and passenger space. So we got, you know, two grand ish from these four things that we just did. Oh, the, the porn spam is back. Oh my god, I'm gonna be sitting here deleting spam messages. All right, rented. So now what we can do is just look for more jobs. So that should be all the cargo. Uh, let me check the plane again, make sure everything is gone. Sometimes I've, I think a while back when I first did on air, I had like, I was just taking one dude in the plane everywhere I went and forgot that he was still there and they'll stay in the cargo, like on board until you get to their destination or you like cancel that job or something. So, all right, we're totally empty now, which is good. All right. So here I can find another job. All right, cool. And what's what's nice is this little this column that I'm sorting by is basically like your pay versus distance. So it's giving you your best bang for your buck uh, in terms of you know how much you're gonna get paid for each mission based on how how long the flight time is. And I also like I think you can do this with Neo Fly too. Like when you choose them, just click on one and then you can use the arrow keys and watch the map on the right. So if you want to fly towards a certain area of the world. So I'm, I'm trying to make my way over to the East Coast. I started in California, and so I've just been slowly flying to the East. Um, so I can decide, you know, how long of a flight I want, things like that. And you can also, there's just a ton of filters here. Like I'm excluding military airports. I'm excluding airports without lights. I don't really need to do that right now just because we're flying during the day. And then you can also put in, you know, if you only have a certain amount of time, you can change it to a, you know, just a preference on how long the flight is. So this is only showing ones that are more, it looks like more than 250 miles. Oh yeah, I would do, I would do lower than that. Change it to 150.
I'm not sure if they've added new mission types to Neo or to um, on air compared to Neo Fly, but uh, let's see if I filter here. Okay, they have dangerous materials. A lot of these are like subcategories for the you know cargo types. So frat dangerous material and fragile payload. Good transport. These are all pretty much the same. Medical transport, executive and passengers are all just passenger ones. Um, they do have like fighter jet tours. They have these sightseeing uh, sightseeing ones as well. I don't think there are any available here. Um, I think, but Neofly, I think, might be the only one that has like the secret passenger missions where you have to fly what at nighttime under a thousand feet or something like that, AGL, <laughs> the whole time to like, you know, like smuggle a you know a criminal basically. <laughs> All right, so these all go up to 500 miles. I like doing shorter, shorter flights though. Denver Center, Air Canada, five one five is passing flight level three four zero, descending six thousand nine hundred feet. All right, this is going to. This has got to be a small airport, right? Airport size one, which pretty much means I think it's based on the runway length, so it's probably less than a five thousand foot runway. Yeah, three thousand feet. All right, let me turn off the ATC. There we go. Uh, do I prefer on air or Neofly? I would say on air. If I if I flew helicopters, I think, or did more more bush flying, I think I would do Neofly because they have those cool missions like search and rescue and stuff like that. But since I don't do that, I like I like on air mainly because. Mainly because it's persistent, I guess. Like the it's super nerdy, but because it's all backed up online, I really like that. Like I'm not worried about losing my career. Whereas with Sky Park and Neofly, I did reset my careers on those when I formatted or I got a new hard drive. So, um, yeah, there's just something something about having it all backed up that I like. If you want to play with other people too, I think uh, I think on air is the way to go, just because they have the virtual airlines and stuff like that. I want to do a slightly larger airport, I think, so we can get a nice IFR approach going. Uh, let's just look for a more major airport. Let's see. I can change it to airport size, like, two. That'll probably give me airports lar large enough to have instrument approach procedures. All right, some of these, all of these that are listed with a little red clock, you actually have to wait for a certain time of day to accept them or to do the flight. You could, you could take them now, but the flight itself starts at a specific time. You know, like a passenger is like, so this is a medical one. So, you know, it's trying to make it more realistic. Like, you know, the passenger will be ready to go at this time. We need to fly them there. Hey, Jax. Uh, which mod? I don't use any mods for the 208 itself. Um, so the plane is just stock, but it has, and, and I'm running the beta for sim update 10. So I have the NXI 1.0 is here. Does on air require paid sub? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it seems it's expensive if you do it month to month, but the the longer of a term you pay for, the cheaper it is. So like I just renewed it for two years, so I'm getting, uh, I'm getting two years of it for it was like fifty dollars, fifty U.S. dollars for two years. So it's not too bad. I mean, Navigraph is a hundred dollars a year roughly. Um, but yeah, you can. What I would recommend is, I mean, I would start. I would tell anyone to start with Neofly because it's free. It's very similar to On Air outside of the virtual airline stuff. And it actually does have some more fun mission types, more unique stuff like the search and rescue. So I think everyone should start with Neofly. Okay, still looking for a job here. Uh, hey, Michael, just, oh, you're just installing Flight Sim. Didn't know this side of it existed. Yeah, if you're on, if you're on PC, it does. Unfortunately for Xbox, there are no, there are no mods like this, like career mode things, um, that exist in the marketplace. Cause the only way to mod the Xbox version is by purchasing things in the marketplace in the Sim. 
Um, so these are all external. So yeah, I have them linked in the video description, the most popular ones. So on air company, which is this one, Neofly, I would start there cause it's free. And then sky park, sky parks, the most beautiful of them. It's the most simple to use and the most flexible. Um, you don't have to like manage a fleet of aircraft. You don't have to worry about your money really, or your fuel or your, the weight, weight and balance, all that stuff. It's a lot more casual, but it's good, a good way to give you kind of an intro into it. But yeah, let's start with Neofly and see what you think. Um, they have a new beta. What is it? Neofly 4 beta, is it? I just did a stream on it like a couple weeks back to check it out. Um, so they redid their interface too, so it's quite a bit better than it is right now. Video on how to install the NXI. Um, all you have to do is go to the InSim marketplace and install it from the marketplace. And if you're on, if you're using the sim update 10 beta, like I am, then you automatically get it in all of the stock planes cause it's built in. And if you fly a third party plane, like a marketplace plane, like a Kodiak or whatever, then you need to just again, install the marketplace version. It doesn't hurt to install both of them. I think you can just always install both of them. All right, what is this? Sorry, I gotta find find a job here. All right, this is dangerous material. This is flying us into South Dakota, so that's cool. We can go to a new state. And what's this airport? Does that say Pierre? K P I R Pierre Regional. So let's check out the info for this airport. All right, all the runways are about 7,000 feet long. Curious if there's an instrument approach there just because I want to try one out. Let's look up. I'm going to just look it up here really quickly on the VFR map, right? K P I R. And yep, they have an ILS. This is, this is so nice, actually. I was going to tab out and like go to Sky Vector or something, but I can figure out if it's got an ILS approach just by looking it up really quickly here. So yeah, it's got an ILS on runway 31. Who knows if that'll be favorable. It looks like it might be. The winds are at 360. It'd be a, a bit of a crosswind, I guess. My winds are at 360. Yeah, they're probably, probably using that runway. Yeah, because that's what, 50 degrees off from runway 31 heading, but it's, you know, 70 degrees off from runway 07. Yeah, so 31 is probably active right now there. So yeah, let's do this one. Let's go to Pierre, South Dakota. All right, so I'll go back here and choose this mission. It was dangerous materials, 453 pounds of cargo. We can hold like several thousand pounds of cargo mattering our fuel. So what I like to do is try to stack them up. So what I can do is now go and look for another job and see if we can find one going to the same airport, ideally. Maybe we can bring a few passengers along with us, stack a few jobs up to maximize how much, you know, how much money we're making on this trip. So is there another KPIR? It's KG B. I don't see when there's a KPUB. And then the other thing we could do um, is scroll through them again and just find one that's going in that direction, something that's going to the northeast and stack them up that way. But that's fine. I'm just going to take this one for now. Just do a single dangerous cargo mission. Uh, the beta won't mess up any add-ons, right? It is possible that it'll mess up the add-ons. Well, more likely what's possible is that the add-ons will cause the sim to crash. So, um, you know, what you can do is install the beta and, you know, it'll take some time to download it and install it. You can try it out. I actually haven't removed any of my mods. Um, I, I haven't removed anything. I don't really run too many mods and add-ons, but I haven't had to remove anything for this beta. So... It's possible that you have the same experience or it's possible that it just crashes over and over again for you, Matt. It really matters how many you have. And that's actually why I don't like running a lot of mods if I don't really don't have to. I just I just want the sim to be stable. So I try not to tempt fate and have too many things installed. <laughs> hey, cool lemon. Any tips for ILS landings? Uh, you just, you know, you just have to know the procedure basically. 
Um, I'm gonna do one here on this flight probably. So if you wanna, if you wanna stick around while I do it, we can. You can ask me any questions on the way, or I have a few videos on ILS approaches if you wanna watch those too. All right, so we're gonna go from KLSK to KPIR. So I'm gonna go back here to Simbrief, get a new flight plan. See if this one's more complicated than the last one. KLSK, KPIR. It's taking uh, quite a bit longer than it normally does. And then uh, after it loads, I'll choose our aircraft type here. I just have, the only customization I have is I just have the, I have a custom one here at the top just because I put in my tail number. Um, but the 208 is in the normal list. Does on air work in VR? So, I mean, it's an external program, so it'll be running in the background. You know, you, you can use the sim in VR. You know, if I happen to have VR on, it'd be working the same way it is now. The only thing they have that's like a VR add-on, they do have a little toolbar thing you can install up here, and that'll show you a moving map. Uh, it'll basically show you the same moving map that this will show once I start the flight. But yeah, you can use you can use VR with On Air and Sky Park and all of you know and NeoFly, um, FS Economy, all those career mods. They'll work. They'll work fine because they're just running in the background. So yeah. All right. Um, good. So we have. Oh yeah, I forgot actually last time to put in our um, to put in our weight. So if I wanted to do the fuel calculations accurately, I need to do that. 453 pounds is our weight. Um, what is 453 pounds? Pounds in tons. It gives us 0 0.22 tons. So let's put 0 0.3 to be safe. And then here's the route it's recommending. We're just flying to two different VORs, TST and PIR. And then it shows us a preview of this route down here. So the second, uh, that second waypoint PIR, that's the same as the airport code. So that's going to be the VOR for that airport. And it's most likely right on the, on the field itself. So this is almost the same as our last route where we're just pretty much going to one VOR nearby from our departure and then flying to our destination direct pretty much. So, um, so I'm not sure what we're going to do with the PIR VOR. Uh, it could be our initial approach fix for um, the approaches. So we're going to be, let's see it. It is to the east of the airfield. So, and our approach was going to be at, what was it? Runway three, one would be active. So that's facing up in this direction. So we're probably not even going to go to PIR, but we'll put it in for now. And then once we get towards the approach, we'll, we'll figure out what we're doing with the ATC. All right. So let's program this all in. We've got a flight plan and we're going to clear this whole thing out. So this is another another great thing is, you know, we're in the plane, we're loaded in, we're at our parking spot, all that. You know, we got the batteries and avionics on already. And instead of just quitting out, going back to the world map to do our next flight plan because of how ATC worked previous to this beta, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this. We would have to, if we want Microsoft Flight Sim ATC, we would have to go back to the world map and do it. But now we can just use delete flight plan, start from scratch, and then we can, you know, get our IFR clearance through ATC again. Hey, Mountain. That's my dog, by the way, the Mountain. Um, so here, though, it, it is untowered, isn't it? What was weird is on the approach, we were able to contact the tower briefly. Now the tower is not available in this list. Oh, we're on the tower, aren't we? We're on the tower, that's why. I thought it was still on with Denver Center, actually. All right, so, all right, this will work just fine. So we'll be able to get our clearance from the ground. As long as there are no bugs, this should work. All right, so let's program this in again. So origin is where we are. K, L, S, K, right? Lusk, there we go. And now we'll put in our destination, which is what, Pierre, K, P, I, R, I think. Yep, Pierre, and that's in South Dakota, or is it North Dakota? Uh oh, I don't wanna say the wrong state. In case there's anyone from the Dakotas here. I think it was in... I think it's in South Dakota. Okay, it is in South Dakota. Okay, so that's right. KPIR. Hit enter. Don't know the runway yet. 
And then on route, we just have two waypoints. We'll just put them both in, even though I don't think we'll need the next one. TST and PIR. TST. Okay, one of these is 6,000 nautical miles away. You can see that right here. And the second one is 49 miles away, so it's definitely going to be the second one here. Toadstool. All right. Oh, it's the Toadstool VOR. Well, it's really called the Toadstool VOR. <laughs> All right. That's kind of awesome. Uh, and then PIR is going to be the next one. That's another VOR. Papa India Romeo. I am not even going to try. All right. Pure Sanuga. Pure Sanuga. Something. All right. And then, of course, it's not Brazil or Finland. So when this happens, if you get these duplicate waypoints, it's because the same waypoint exists in multiple places in the database or multiple times in the database. So there are apparently three VORs that use this, um, use this waypoint code. So we're picking the one in the US, of course. All right, we're good. And you could probably see this already. While As soon as I put in an origin and a destination, you can see right here, we have the magical request IFR clearance option. So we just can use that right away. So previously, before the beta, we had to go to the world map to get this to work correctly. Now we can do it all within the sim, just like with the old G1000 and the other stock avionics, you can do this. But um, this is brand new capability with the NXI now that it's being integrated fully and as the default for the sim. So it's an awesome improvement. All right, so that's all good. Let's just get the engine started back up here. So these are checklists. All right, this goes forward. Oh, we don't do low idle yet, right? All right, reset this and go to eval. All right, yeah, the battery and beacon good already. Fuel boost. Fuel boost on. I have that on a switch over here. On fuel condition lever. Low idle starter. Oh, whoops, that was right. Starter off. All right, looks good. Off. Fuel boost. Norm. Avionics number two switch on. Already on. All right, there we go. And before I forget, let's put our flaps to takeoff position. All right, and strobe is on, parking brake release. Okay, cool, we're good. All right, and Navigraph, let's see, if we, we're gonna bring the na bring Navigraph back up again. Actually, can I add the new flight? I'm not sure if it, it'll recognize the new one. Let me try closing this and reopening it, seeing if it kind of reinitializes it and finds our new flight plan. Yes, that's so cool. Okay, so the reason I've been, I double click here. You can use this little plus and mi minus button. This kind of minimizes it. So it doesn't kind of reload it and reinitialize it every time you open it. If you hit the X, you know, it closes it out almost completely, I guess. And then if you reopen it, it's kind of reinitializing the whole thing. So I just closed it completely and reopened it. And it notices that we changed our flight plan on the NXI, which is also awesome. So I don't have to reprogram this or import it from Simbri for anything. I can just hit load flight plan. Yep, there we go. That's correct. TST, PIR, and then KPIR. So we have that all pulled in too, which is super convenient. And then it, on the charts list here, once we get closer, hopefully we get the ILS, but we can go to our approach here. So I'm actually going to pin these things um, to the pin board. I'm going to start from the left, actually. I don't think you can reorder them. So let's start with our current airport. Oh yeah, we have no charts, right? No charts for this airport. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pin the ILS for 3.1 because I think that's what we're gonna get. And that pins it to the bottom here so I can just click it later to get to the chart really quickly. We can actually pin that on the moving map as well. We'll do that in a little bit. We'll do that when we get closer. All right, and it's tracking our position. Oops, that makes the interface bigger. Whoops, I keep using that as the zoom button. This is the zoom down here. All right, cool. So I'm just going to minimize that again. All right, so now I think we're good to go. Let's request our IFR clearance. 
our engines are all started up and um, let's go whoops let's go and to on air and get everything loaded up so we need our fuel and our passengers loaded up or sorry our cargo we have valuable equipment being loaded 453 pounds and we have plenty of fuel and let's check out the over here when we generate our flight plan in sim brief we'll just see what they rec what they uh, have us estimating for fuel and it includes the reserve fuel i think it's 45 minutes i have it set to all right block fuel 15 16. We currently have 686, so I'm just going to bring that up to 1516 or above 1516. All right, let's go up to 16. All right, we're about 1600 pounds of fuel. So I have the passengers checked over here on the left, so those are going to be loaded. We have validate, and now there's a little timer that runs to load the fuel and cargo. All right, once that's done, we just need to start the flight in on air. All right, so while we're waiting for that, Request our clearance. Tower Cessna November 3572 Delta IFR to Kilo Papa India Romeo, ready to copy. Cessna November 3572 Delta is cleared to Kilo Papa India Romeo Airport as filed. Takeoff runway 28 climb. Oh, what is it to that? 28 13,000. 7655 and 13,000 feet. Read that back. Cessna November Set our altitude Delta selection up to 13,000. India Romeo Airport has filed. Take off runway 28 climb and maintain 13,000 feet. Departure and we have 135.6 in our standby already. And we got the squawk code in. Delta read back correct. Contact ground on 122.8. Good day. All right, we're we are on ground, so when we're ready, we can request taxi IFR. All right, cool. Now let's go check on our loading. That's all done. And the offset is minus eight hours still. So it'll be during the day. Let me see, what time is it? Nine, that puts us at 1 p.m. So let's go like two, three, four. Let's go a little later in the day. All right, I'm just gonna do minus five hours. What's nice is you can set a global offset. You can probably barely see this on the stream, but per flight, you can just choose what time offset you want. So. By default, I have mine at negative eight because I'm usually flying at nighttime and I want to see daytime most of the time or by the end of the night, if I stay up late, I'll see sunsets. But here per flight, you can just change it down here and probably see it here. It'll um, as soon as I hit track, it'll change the time of day. So if you watch the blue color in the, of the sky in the background, when I click start tracking, I oh know it's going to it's going to ding me because I already started the engine, but whatever. So it'll change the time of day. Uh, I guess I guess not much change. Maybe it already did it. I didn't notice it, but it should have changed the time of day. All right, so now we can request. Let's see, let me just make sure here. Okay, yeah, this is good. Tracking page. Engine is started. Okay, everything's good there. Our flight plan is in. We know our altitude. We're going to climb to 13,000. Um, let's just check the METAR or check the uh, check the ATIS or the AWOS in this case. All right, wind calm. Calm and clear. 26, that matches down here. All right, 2991. All right, back to ground. We actually have our departure frequency still in the standby right here, 135.6. I didn't write any of that down. You know, if you're doing VAT sim or Pilot Edge or something, you're going to be writing a lot on a notepad. Um, because I know the, you know, Microsoft Flight Sim ATC, it'll just, you know, let me just hit a button. It'll remember all that for me, uh, which is great. But yeah, if you're going to do VAT sim or IVAO or Pilot Edge, just remember you're going to need a lot of paper. Or, you know, you can use your iPad. I have tried to do it on my iPad before, but I actually, it feels weird like writing with my finger, or even having to pick up like the, like an Apple pencil or something or a stylus. So I just like a regular notepad when I'm doing that. Ground Cessna November 3572 Delta ready to taxi IFR. Cessna November 3572 Delta taxi to and hold short of runway 28 using taxiway. Contact tower on 122.8 when ready. There's actually no taxiway, is there? Yeah, I don't think there's actually a taxiway. 
Taxiing hold short runway two eight using taxiway. Sus All right, taxi light is on. Parking brake is off. Props full forward. And let's try not to hit anybody on our way out here. Uh, well, they can give us pushback, right? Was it shift P? Oh, does that work? Uh, oh yeah, it does work. This is always funny because I have this mod that turns into this little like uh, this little like hand truck looking one. <laughs> it's just so funny just watching it operate without a person pushing it. <laughs> Come on, get in there. Alright, hurry it up, please. People are waiting. Oh man, what's going on? <laughs> All right, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna wait for this. We're just gonna off-road it. All right, everybody, watch your heads. Sorry, guy. This is fine. This this is just fine. All right, runway 28, landing lights on, taxi light is on too. All right, and 28 starts over there. Since we uh, selected it, since I selected it here in the flight plan, runway 28 for the departure, it actually draws the draws the line over to the start of the runway, so it's really easy to recognize where the where the start is. I mean, here we only have one runway. <laughs> it's pretty easy. We got a 50/50 chance. Oh, right, there's actually a reverse. Yeah, there is. I could use reverse on this, can I? Forgot about that. I fly the 172 so much, I think, that and the like the diamonds that I totally forgot that that's even a thing. <laughs> and also because I haven't been able to just put in a new flight plan like this, I'm used to going back to the world map and then being in some other parking spot and being all ready to go. This man is live this hour. I know I'm trying something new, a little night stream here. And just, uh, we'll see how this goes. I know, you know, it's it's easier to, to watch a stream like in the middle of the day on a Saturday or something for most people. But yeah, I think I just want to consistently do some on-air company flights, work on my on-air career, and just, uh, yeah, have something consistent going because I'm, as you guys know, I don't put out videos too often. But streaming is something I could, you know, do a couple times a week consistently. And just focusing on on-air is great just because, you know, I don't have to figure out where I get to go, you know, figure out where I want to fly. It's all, uh, it's all pretty much done for me with on-air or Neo Fly or something like that. All right, so our flaps are already in takeoff configuration, first notch. It's going to go all the way down here. They said wind calm. The, the sock over there is blowing just a little bit. What is this sock? Is it three knots, I think? Three knots per colored section on it? Per uh, per red and white section is three knots, I'm pretty sure. I think it goes up to 15. So it looks like we got three or four knots. We'll have a little bit of crosswind from our, uh, from our right once we turn around. All right, taxi lights are off. Once we spin around, we'll sink our heading. Sink our heading bug to the runway heading. We already got 13,000 feet put in for our climb to altitude. There are, no, uh, there are no charts at all available for this airport. So we're just taking off and just climbing straight up to 13,000 feet because that's what they told us. There's no like obstacle departure procedures or anything. At least according to Navigraph, there's nothing at all. Maybe it's just not in the database or something right now. Got our bird friends there. All right, runway 28, which is what they assigned us. Clearly we're on the right runway. Our heading is at 280 right now. All right, 285 for the runway heading. So we're sinking our 
Sinking our heading bug. And then let's set flight level change mode. I should have done this already. Flight level change. We'll do a, let's do hundred let's do a hundred knots again. That's good. Alright, we're good to go. So going high idle now. Should probably let that spin up a little bit. Alright, 745 prop RPM went up. Alright, let's go. I do want to look up in the POH afterwards or if I remember to. Just the procedure with a with a throttle and like the torque limit on takeoff. Just because it goes into the red. You can see it flashing red right now at full full throttle. Alright, 50, 60 knots, 70, 65, 70 is our rotate. Nice. Just gonna pull the throttle back just a little bit so it's not screaming at me. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Good thing on air company doesn't know that we weren't uh we weren't cleared to take off. <laughs> My nav lights off too. Great. Good job. Alright, sorry ATC. We're just gonna just gonna abruptly change frequency here so that guy can't yell us anymore. I'm gonna request flight following because we have to do that. Like I mentioned with the first flight. So we're gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna pitch down a little bit and then get our flaps up. We're gonna do that first because we just have to. Wait, hold on, that's weird. Wait, we got our... Huh, wait, that is weird. Wait, it's forcing us to do flight following instead of just contacting them because we already had our IFR clearance. I wonder if that's because I missed the clear to take off part of it and then they would have passed us off and then it would have known? Anyway. I guess for the next the next flight I'll have to figure that out. Whoops. Alright, acknowledge radar contact 29901 on our altimeter. That's still correct. We're going to spin around here. All right, so now we have the IFR things again. I, I think I'm, I'll have to test this again to figure it out, but um, even though we had our IFR clearance already, either me not getting the uh, permission to take off messed with it, or even when you switch to the center controller, it doesn't have your IFR flight plan somehow. But in any case, it lets us do it once we ask for flight following. India Romeo Airport as filed. Squawk zero tree one six. Zero tree one six. That's what we got. Radar contact seven thousand five hundred feet. All right, let's turn on nav mode. One continue to Tango Sierra Tango turning and following heading zero nine or five. Okay. Zero nine or five. Yes, that's our desired track. That's good. Climb and maintain fifteen thousand feet. Continue to Tango Sierra Tango turning. Following heading zero nine or five, resume own navigation. All right, we were at thirteen. We're gonna bump that up to fifteen thousand. All right, that's good. All our lights are good. Air temperature is eighteen. Okay, we're on the way. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to test that. Um, I think I'll be done after this flight because I'm gonna eat a late dinner after this, but. Um, this one's going to take a bit. 229 miles, right? Uh, 2452. No way. Wait, is this going to take us two hours? Oh, no. What have I done? Wait, there's no way. This. Wait, this is 228 miles? Uh oh, what have I done? I'm just double checking. Did I actually pick a flight that long? <laughs> Wait, this says estimated time on route is an hour. 204 nautical miles. All right, we'll see what happens once we get up there. Uh-oh. <laughs> Zero tree one six. Exactly. All right, so we're going up to one five thousand. And we have a very boring route. We just have two waypoints, basically. 
two on route waypoints. The second one is actually right next to the destination airport, so. I might have bit off more than I could uh, than I could do tonight with the as far as the flight time. And I can't accelerate in on air company. So hopefully we're looking at more like an hour. I'm just gonna keep our throttle. Oh no, am I gonna break the plane if I do that though? I'll keep it as high as I can without being in the red. For me, I'm so used to doing shorter flights that uh, something like a two hour flight seems insane. But anybody that flies uh, the airliners, that's just, that's just normal. What we need is some weather to fly through so things are cooler looking. Alright, we're at 11,300, going for 15,000. 10 degrees Celsius outside. And there's nothing showing up on the next ride. I have next ride turned on. We have no precipitation to worry about. Can double check that with the weather radar if we want to. Zoom that all the way out. It's completely blank. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, let's turn that back off. All right, 2795. 127.95 for Cessna 72 Delta. All right, switching that over. Let's contact Denver our next controller here. November, three, five, hey, Joe, seven, two, been flying the 737. Yeah, I usually run two to three hour flights. Yeah, and these little and the GA planes, I pretty much fly just you know smaller planes. This is, I did fly the CJ4 a little bit to try it out uh, months ago, but yeah, I fly the Grand Caravan a lot. I like the Kodiak. Uh, sorry, what's the altimeter they gave us? Two nine nine one, which is what we're at. Continue to TST. All right, almost at fifteen thousand. Maybe they can give us higher. I think our ceiling in the Grand Caravan is. Um, let me see. I think it's 20,000 feet. Oh, 25,000 feet, actually. Okay. And how are the winds looking? Oh, we got a tailwind. Awesome. We're going to make a turn, though, and then we won't have as good of a tailwind. But we have a just this 23 knot tailwind right now. Alright, we're gonna climbing at a thousand feet a minute still. One thousand feet to go, or twelve hundred feet to go. Hey, this light. I wonder if this bug's ever gonna be fixed. So there's like a cabin light switch right here. If I hit it, you'll see this light went off, but this cabin light went on. So now I'll switch it off. This light's off. This light is back on. So the only way I figured out to turn this off is to press the shortcut key L. So I'll hit that, but it's going to turn off all the other lights as well. So now all lights are off because I hit L. And then these stayed on because of uh, my Bravo switches. And I'll turn these other two on that I don't have bound to a switch. That's the only way I can figure to do that. So now that light is off and, the, and the, all the lights are off inside. So we just have our... What's here? Our landing nav strobe and beacon are on. It's funny, there's just always this glow, especially if you fly at night. Every time you turn the camera, you just see this glow here from the corner. <laughs> All right, almost up to one five thousand. Uh, 
Oh man, this is this is a long flight, isn't it? All right, we have 211 miles. Yeah, it's estimating our landing time. Oh, why is this suspended? Whoops, let me click that. I think it, uh, oh, that's weird. It's suspended when we landed, right? Because we hit our last waypoint in the flight plan. Um, but then I reset the flight plan, deleted the whole thing, reprogrammed it, took off, and it, it is on course to our first waypoint, so I'm not sure why it still was suspended. If it was suspended still, I would have expected it wouldn't be taking us to our first waypoint correctly. All right, and then in the procedure here, let me see. I think what we're going to get is runway 31. Yeah, the ILS for 31. And then this is where Navigraph is handy. Well, I mean, we can see it here in the NXI with previewing as we choose the initial approach fixes or the transitions. You can kind of see where they are. Sometimes it's hard for me to figure out where the... So the runway is here, so that's our final approach course. So Hatka is up here to the northeast. This one, Sabku, is to the west. This one might be good for us. Rule has... Yeah, we're coming from this way. We'll, yeah, we'll probably need to do that reversal. And then PIR, this VOR, is off to the east a bit. So it looks like Cabku. Cabku is probably our most likely. We're coming in from this direction. We'll turn right and just swing around and be lined up with the runway. And then let me see how that squares with Navigraph. Look over here. Add and edit procedures. Approach. ILS for runway 31. And then cab crew. Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, this is. Oh, yeah, we're, we're not coming from the west, though. We're coming from the southwest. So it does have us. Our original flight plan and sim brief has us going to this VOR right here, the Pierre VOR. So if we did that, we would um, just turn around this way, do a reversal over here, whichever the protected side is, and then and then fly in. So yeah, over here that would look like this because it has us going to PIR already. I mean, we're just taking a guess here. I mean, we're coming from the southwest down here, so Cabcu doesn't make not necessarily doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, we'll see what ATC assigns us at the end of the day, but. So I think this one, Burl, might be the best because we're going to, if we go to PIR as planned, we're going to end up doing a reversal anyway. I'm actually curious how it's going to calculate the reversal here. So it has us fly over it, then fly outbound, then do the reversal, then come back in. So let's see what that looks like over here. Hmm. <laughs> this one's interesting. <laughs> so yeah, this is the initial approach fix. We're coming in from the southwest. This is weird. Does it have us? Oh, right. All right. That's right. Because KPIR is already here. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. I'm getting confused because KPIR is already in the destination here. So I need to remove this. There we go. Because, you know, normally, you know, once I activate the approach, it'll take us to the initial approach fix. But because I added it in advance and I already had our destination as a separate waypoint, that was a little confusing. So, yeah, it's having us come in and then... Once we fly over it, okay, it's having us just do like a U-turn here and out. It's a little confusing. I'm not really sure. Let me do it this way. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one. <laughs> So we're coming in from this white line here, and then it looks like it has us make a right-hand turn to fly over brulee. Oh, it's brulee, right? Like creme brulee. 
and then go out and then we're doing our reversal and coming back in. I don't know what this other line right here is though, because once we're coming inbound from Filta, we're coming, we're on our final approach course already. So I'm just not sure what this extra loop right here is. All right, we'll see what happens when we get closer. All right, turn the cursor off. All right, no word from ATC yet. I guess we could request higher if we want. We have a ways to go, so... I don't know, let's get an increase of... What are we at, 15? Let's go up to 19. Denver Center, Cessna 72 Delta. Request flight level 190. All right, they approved. All right, up to one nine thousand. We'll need standard for the altimeter after that. I actually don't know the answer to this, but when do you train? I mean, we're gonna pass through eighteen thousand on our way up, so we need to switch to standard. I assume I could just switch to standard now. I don't know if that's bad practice, but. Um, there's actually, there's also a shortcut down here, even though we're, we only have one click to get to standard. You can hit standard down here, so it'll read standard. Anyway, I guess in this case it's not, it's probably not a big deal, right? We're not going to be changing altitude. If we, if we decided to change altitude to something underneath 18,000, under our transition altitude, then I would, you know, get the local altimeter again. But I know when you use the standard barrel, what's nice is it saves your previous altimeter setting. So if we did need to go back, I can just hit standard again. It'll take me back to 2901. So I don't have to worry about, you know, what it was. If it was like 3004 and I changed it manually to standard, changed it to 2902, I would have to have remembered what the previous altimeter was if I canceled that climb or something. But that's the benefit to using the standard button. It is a couple of clicks, though. It's like two whole clicks. It's a lot. All right, cool. We're almost at Tango Sierra Tango. You change when you pass through in real life. Okay. Yeah, it seems like it's probably a no-no to switch it now. But I also don't want to forget. Oh, we need to... Uh, Lower our flight level change airspeed here. We're not going up at all. We're climbing at like a hundred feet per minute. And I think that I don't think you can do anything with the oxygen in this. Right down here, there's an oxygen, right? Oh, that's static air. No, it's just the one up here, but I think it's just always off. And this isn't uh, functional up here at all. All right, let's double check on on air real quick. Still tracking us. Looks like, I'm not sure. I think I got dinged for having the engine on already when it started, but I'm not sure. We'll, we'll find out at the end. But it definitely, uh, it, it definitely penalizes you if you have um, certain lights on when you're not supposed to and things like that, which at the sh at shutdown last time I had shut down, but I kept the avionics and the lights on and it dinged me for having the lights on when the when the engine was off, so. Let's see if I remember this time when we land to not do that. Oh, I think this is new too, where it shows the METAR right here. So it's showing me the METAR in this little green icon. And it's got a little, um, like a wind direction indicator on it too, a little wind barb. So if I mouse over that, you know, it's showing me, I think it's just showing me green because it's VFR. Right, let's see what the clouds say. Um, yeah, it's just clear. 10 miles of visibility, and then the winds currently say... Oh, it's doing it right here. I didn't realize it was decoding it right here. Yeah, 190 at 17 knots. And then 2947. And then it's cool down here in the bottom right. You can kind of see our, our all of our... Uh, metrics, so we have our RPMs, our speed, our altitude, our power percentage, and all that. Speaking of power, let's check our hour, see our climb, we're at 400 feet a minute. Alright, we're going to have to bring this down even further. 
Let's go 100 knots again. And give it a little more power. Just trying to keep it out of the red on the torque there. I guess this is where the TBM would come in handy if we want to take these longer trips. But I think the TBM, I think the Grand Caravan carries more than the TBM, I'm pretty sure. I think in both passenger count and cargo weight, pretty sure the caravan holds a lot more, but obviously it's it's a boat. We're much slower in this thing. Oh yeah, I have two of the same pilots in here. I hope they make it so later you can just turn off the co-pilot. I think there's a mod for that that I obviously don't have installed, but that would be a nice change. I mean, we haven't seen any traffic at all. All right, looks like we're starting our left turn. Yep, here we go. All right, so we're turning left. We're pretty much just direct from this point on. All right, almost at 18,000. I have standard on still. Very bad. Breaking the rules. All right, 1,000 feet to go. See the flashing, flashing indicator there on the selected altitude to let us know we're at 1,000 feet to go. I actually don't see this kind of view too much. I don't think I go over like, I don't even feel like I go over 10,000 that often. And we, we haven't needed our landing lights for a while. I'll turn those off. All right, now we have a horrible crosswind. <laughs> we, we were going with like a 20 plus knot tailwind on that first leg, but now we have uh, just a nasty crosswind. At least, at least it's not a headwind. Oops, and I had yaw damper off again. I Forever the yaw damper uh, didn't do anything in the 208. I think, I think it was Sim Update 9 where they uh, implemented it. Maybe that's why I didn't get the comfort bonus on the last uh, flight. All these great. Oh no, we don't have any passengers right now, huh? We just have a, uh, we just have some cargo, but it's dangerous cargo. And now I'm thinking about flying the Kodiak because the Kodiak, when you load up the weight, oh, I wonder if they fixed this in honor. I'll have to check out the Kodiak on another flight. Maybe I'll swap out the Grand Caravan for a Kodiak somewhere if I can find one to rent. Um, what's really nice is when you mess with the fuel and weights here, as you're adding them, it'll actually uh, fill in the seats with passengers and fill up boxes in the back for cargo. Um, it's super cool. But at the time I was using it, when on air companies set the weight, and actually I guess that's still the case because here it's not showing the weight, right? Yeah, nothing is set here. And it is set because when you load the weight, you can actually just like look at the wheels. You can just see the plane get weighted down when it actually loads it. So it is loaded in there, but it's not reflected here on the weights and balances screen in the sim, unfortunately. Oh, that's where you're in, Aaron. Awesome. Yeah, the, the Kodiak is really, really great. Uh, I've just been flying the Grand Caravan lately just because in general, I try to fly things that everybody has. So... The Grand Caravan just comes, you know, it's in every edition of the Sim. Everyone can fly it. It's a good Kodiak alternative anyway. So I'm just running prop full forward this whole time. All right, it says 2442. It thinks we have another hour and 15 minutes or so to go. You know what I should do? I, I can't use time acceleration. I wonder if it will, I wonder if it'll ding me for turning off live, we live weather and giving us a tailwind. <laughs> I don't know how else I can, there's no other way for me to, um, to speed this up. <laughs> I'm just not used to doing flights that are this long. Hey Oliver, how's it going? We 
we also just have fully clear skies this whole time. We're heading from Wyoming to South Dakota right now. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're pretty similar. I think the I think the Kodiak has a much uh, much lower uh, runway distance requirement, though. Let's see, because the Grand the Grand Caravan needs like twenty two hundred feet, I think, for a um, for a short field takeoff. Kodiak one hundred. But I think the Kodiak. is much less than that. Kodiak 100 takeoff roll 934 feet and only 765 feet. Yeah, so it needs like a thousand feet whereas the Grand Caravan needs twice as much. <laughs> it's just crazy. That thing just, it just, it just takes off instantaneously. It's awesome. And I think they're gonna be, um, they're going to be introducing a floats version of the Kodiak, I'm pretty sure. I think I saw someone on Discord call it like the Floatiac. Um, but yeah. Enjoy the energy. I feel like it's so low energy. <laughs> I mean, I'm not used to uh, being on one leg for this long. I mean, what do I have to talk about, really? I mean, I know we need to be planning for the approach. We'll see what happens. We can check the METAR again. I think we're going to get the ILS for 3-1, so... Hopefully we get that because I wanted to do a, an instrument approach on this second flight. Uh, oh, I just... Oh, the METAR doesn't show up there. I think I need to go to the very bottom. There we go. So, mattering where you highlight, you may or may not get the METAR. So, you have to go all the way down. I can't, I can't highlight KPIR right here. This doesn't show me the METAR. I either need an on-route waypoint or the destination waypoint line to be highlighted. So, if I had it here and highlighted it, it would work. But in this case, we have to go all the way down here to destination. And then we get the METAR here at the bottom. All right, so we have wind 010 at 10 knots. I think that was, it was similar to that when we took off. So 010, runway 31. You know, that puts it at 70 degrees, right? 70 degrees difference between the wind. This is the METAR though, which is uh, which is true, right? Not magnetic direction. Whereas the runway heading is gonna be magnetic direction. So there's gonna be some variance there. It could be, uh, could be more favorable than, than it looks like. Oh wow, we're actually listening to somebody else. Report who in sight. Oh, it's two Uniteds. And a twin jet. Uh, do we actually see any traffic on on here? Oh, yeah, there's some there's some traffic way up there towards our destination. About three thousand feet below us, heading to the west, but nobody closer than that. Uh, what's cool is somebody else pointed this out in the last stream was that the uh, multiplayer traffic will trigger the traffic alerts now. So um, Deuce, who was in chat earlier, he might still be hanging out. He flew along with me um, in the last stream on Sunday, I think. And it actually shows up on the NX side. I was a little like startled by it because I hadn't seen it in so long. But uh, because he was basically flying in formation with me, it popped up the like solid yellow circle. Um, with like the arrow icon in it as a traffic alert because he was so close, like a collision alert basically. So that's also in the beta. So you, you'll see multiplayer traffic um, and get the multiplayer traffic alerts on the NXI as well. So I think in the regular version, the Sim Update 9 version, you don't see that right now. You just see, you only see live traffic, uh, AI traffic basically, the computer traffic. So whether it's set to AI or I think um, real world traffic, you didn't see multiplayer traffic on here, um, but you do see multiplayer traffic now. So, or in Sim Update 10, this is the beta. So that'll be awesome too. All 
All right, just cruising it. One nine thousand, nineteen thousand feet. We have two hundred and five miles to go, and we have a crappy thirty-four knot crosswind right now. This route is kind of a bummer because it's just this straight line just all the way in. So it would be cool if we, I mean, we took advantage of that and flew east more. I wonder how much time it would save if we went over to a waypoint like over here, take advantage of that tailwind going this way and then heading to the north afterwards. Could be kind of nice. I mean, I guess I could do that. I could pick a waypoint more over here. And then just calculate, like, watch the calculation here for the landing time and see if it changes. I don't know if it'll account for the wind, though. Oliver says, what kind of videos do you upload? Is it, like, training or any flight? Yeah, mostly tutorials. I, The videos I've mostly uploaded are around the G1000 NXI in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So I've been following the development of that for the last year. Um, it's been, I think it, the first version came out, yeah, in July last year, I think, or August. So there was this team, this development team called Working Title that um, this group of developers started making their own G1000 mod for Microsoft Flight Simulator because the stock G1000 is pretty limited. And a lot of it was about the autopilot, the routing. Um, and so they did just an incredible job. So I was making videos, or I still am. Um, this is going to be the next big update is the one I'm using now, which is coming out next month. But it's in beta right now and anybody can use it. Um, but yeah, I have videos on pretty much anything related to the Garmin stuff. So like how to use the autopilots, how to use the 530 and 430, how to use the G1000. And the NXI is just such um, a step forward in how good these avionics are. Um, that team did such a good job that they got hired by Microsoft. I think it was like toward the end of last year. And what I'm running right now is the next update of Microsoft Flight Simulator, which comes out next month. So this is the beta and it's public. Anybody can opt in and get the beta. And the beta has the NXI that the working title uh, team made as the default in the sim now. So it's basically replacing the original G1000 with the one that this team made. So it's just a, a huge release and they've just, you know, consistently added more and more and more features. There's tons of work they did on the flight planning system and working with the autopilot to do like course reversals and turn anticipation. And um, it really got rid of a lot of bugs that were in the original. So the most notorious one was like a 180 degree turnaround bug. So you would like get to the, your initial approach fix. And then it would make the first turn and then it would do a 180 and go back to the initial approach fix or something like that. It's been so long that I've kind of forgotten about it because they fixed it in the NXI such a long time ago. Um, so yeah, the, the NXI is just a huge step forward. And that same team is also working on a GNS 530, 430. And they're also redoing the G3000 that they, they made a mod for that's still available. So, I mean... We can only assume that their work is going to consistently be awesome and we're going to get a really good 530-430 replacement and then a, another new G3000 they're like doing from scratch. Um, so they post about those things in their Discord channel pretty regularly. Um, it's, just, it's just awesome. I just love the work they do. It's incredible. Uh, enjoy your channel compared to other channels. Thanks. It looks good. And have some videos to uh, oh on your watch later. Nice. Uh, next stream, I've been streaming a little more often lately. This is kind of the first stab at just flying along with my current career mode. So I use this app called On Air Company. So this app right here. And this is one of a few different career mode apps that are available. Whoa, just got a big gust of wind here. All right, it looks like everything's okay. Um, so On Air Company is one of these career mode kind of apps that run. If you're on PC, you can run these and... Oh, what the... Oh, resume... Oh, flight in progress. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd canceled my flight or something. So, um... What happened is... Uh, yeah, I've just been doing on-air company for a while now. So I'm just doing a stream on this. So I'm going to start up maybe doing this a couple... Once or twice a week. And just do a... Do... Just stream my current flights that I'm doing. 
I usually do these on my own time, but I thought I might as well stream them to just, you know, keep keep some more current content going and hang out with people that are regulars. Uh, could I help you as a starter to come up with a name and a logo? <laughs> well, the the logo I have is just um, it's just like a cartoonized version of a photo of me from a while back. <laughs> I want to save the photo. Man, the photo is forever ago. It's just like a cartoon version. I, I paid somebody on Etsy to make. So um, there are a lot of great artists on sites like Etsy that you can hire. So I, I just hired someone and paid them to make to make the little logo, a little avatar. So I use that. And then with the name, I mean, it's just my name is Kip. So the on the ground part was actually just a joke uh, because... There are so many like aviation content people and simmers and stuff and real life pilots and they'll you know they'll put like you know John in the sky or John at John at eighteen thousand feet or you know something referring to their altitude or being in the air being in the sky. So I thought it was funny. My my girlfriend and I were talking about it before I started the channel. We we're like, how about on the ground? Just make fun of yourself because you just you're literally never flying in real life. You just sit in a chair. So I'm perpetually on the ground. So that's that's where the channel name came from. It sounds silly when you first read it. It's like Kip on the ground. What? <laughs> but yeah, it's fine. It it worked, so we just went with it. Yeah, I mean it, it's up to you. Like I just for me, I just use my name because it's I don't want to have a pseudonym or anything. So I just use my name. Um, and yeah, it was just a little self-deprecating humor kind of thing. And I still haven't flown a Discovery flight at all after uh, two years on the sim now. I think this month, or maybe last month, marked two years in simming. Yeah, I've, I've had a good time doing it, but uh, unlike my partner, she flies. I'm just scared. I'm, I'm mostly scared to fly. <laughs> but I was originally learning to... Uh, to just be less nervous when I fly with her. I've only been a few times with her in like a, you know, a smaller plane, like a, like a Piper Cherokee size plane. So, um, it helped me a bit because when we would fly, I would like, you know, distract myself with four flight and listening to ATC and trying to ignore any bumps that scare the crap out of me. So, <laughs> you know, you know, if something scares you, if you educate yourself about it, then you remove a lot of your nerves about the thing. Right. So, that's kind of why I got into doing it myself. But I would say I'm surprised by the amount of views and stuff the videos I put up have, even the very first one. So I think there's an appetite for good, um, good flight sim and other sim content. So if that's what you're doing, just go for it. Now, there's a lot to learn to get started, you know, about recording and editing videos and doing getting good vocal like vocal mic sound and stuff like that but you know i love that stuff and i, lo I love learning about all the nerdy stuff so um yeah it's just you know i enjoy it i wish i was more productive than i am but yeah it's always a challenge right something that a lot of people like me are doing in their spare time so it's not every day after work that you're super motivated to sit down and work for hours and hours and hours to make one video <laughs> i think uh i think it probably takes me a good like I don't know, eight, 10, 12 hours to make a, maybe even longer to make like a 20, 20 minute video or so. Uh, channel name makes sense because all the simmers are never in the air, they're on the chair. Yeah, that's where like, I, I don't know who came up with couch captain, but um, I saw that somewhere a while back. And so I think that phrase is funny. Or it's, uh, what is it, armchair captain? Is what simmer, a lot of simmers will refer to themselves as, like armchair captains. They don't actually fly planes. But um, oh, what was that survey? There was a survey done. It was, I think it was by, was it by Navigraph? They did a survey um, last year. It was like they're doing like an annual survey. I have to look it up, but they're, they tell, they like did a survey of how many people were actual pilots versus not. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. I want to say it was like. It was, I feel like it was more than I thought it was. There's no way that you're not a real life pilot. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I wouldn't lie about that, right? Like if I was a real life pilot in any way, I would be proud to 
say that I was, but I am definitely not. I haven't. I have never touched a yoke in my life. I haven't even sat in the front seat, have I? Yeah, I haven't even sat right seat. I've only sat back seat before. So when my partner flies, like she'll have her instructor with her, or a friend of ours has flown in the front seat, but I have not. Um, yeah, definitely not lying. It's kind of embarrassing to say that I'm not. <laughs> I mean, there are so many, there are so many, you know, real life pilots that use the sim, you know, to supplement their training and stuff and review, review routes and, you know, review procedures and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm not one of them. I don't know. I think it's, it's like the nerd side of me that loves, you know, I've been a gamer my whole life, but, um, you know, this stuff, like the avionics, and why all my videos are about the autopilot and the Garmin systems is because I'm a computer dork, you know, at heart. That's where that's where my interests are. And that's why I think the systems are cool. You know, I, I, I just I was just instantly fascinated by all of the um, all the procedures and the routes and the rules and how autopilot works. And which is, you know, on the downside, that's why I don't know much, as much about VFR flying or, um, you know, flying a traffic pattern super well. You know, I, just on the last flight, I had to go around because my, uh, my altitude was not great coming in. But yeah, I mean, it's all learnable. There's so much content on YouTube, too. I mean, and uh, like Bold Method, for example, I think their channel is amazing. I don't know if they've had any recent content, but they have just hours and hours and hours of live streams they did educational live streams where people ask questions and they go over you know plates they go over approaches they go over procedures and all of those things it's just awesome there's so much content out there and you know i don't know i'm like a middle of the ground nerd like i'm not i mean maybe maybe i'm at the high end of being a nerd because i would pick up like the nxi manual and read it before going to bed to learn about a feature that i thought was cool but I don't know it cover to cover, you know? It's, it's huge. There's always something to learn. There's so much stuff to learn. So, I mean, that that's what was nice about the NXI having these incremental updates is, you know, every few weeks or every month or so, I would be learning about the new features uh, that just came out in the latest update and then make a video. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's fun. I definitely took a break this year, though. I mean, you know, I wasn't making videos for four or five months at the beginning of this year. I put one out in January and then took like a four month break. So, um, But the streaming stuff is fun. I mean, it's spinning up a stream is at, it's it's much easier to just hit the stream button. You know, I'll pull up on air, find a new find a new uh, flight to do. You know, I'd be doing this on my own anyway. Um, and then just be able to chat with you guys while I'm doing it and yeah, talk about what's new in the sim Talk about stuff that I learned recently or that I'm trying to learn um, So yeah streaming requires less work up front than making a full edited video and stuff like that But it also gives us a chance to chat with each other, which is super cool. So yeah, like I like both things uh, The plane itself is nice, but the computer science behind it's mind-blowing. Yeah, <laughs> Anything that includes the Garmin and computers make me stare at it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm actually really, really excited for the 530, 430 because I started, I only really started using the NXI more because of the working title team. You know, it was just the stock G1000 before. But, you know, I had, um, I was mostly using the 530 and the 430. Uh, to start, just because those are kind of the starter points, right? The 430 is great. Uh, do you know if helps or if what's coming to Xbox? Helicopters? Are you are you asking? Probably got an autocorrect there on helps. Maybe you're saying helicopters. All right, we're 161 miles total distance to go. Let's see, we got 106 miles to our next waypoint. Oh, I think the... Wait, the distance to go... Wait, is that math right? It says 160, but we only have 105 to the next waypoint, which is right at the airport. Oh, helicopters. Um, helicopters are being introduced at the end of the year. I think it's in November. Um, let me see if I can look it up. 
Um, it's going to be the uh, 40th anniversary. And I assume it's going to be for both. Yeah, so here, uh, 40th anniversary edition. So this was posted, yeah, June 12th. This was posted about a month ago. So the 40th anniversary edition, sorry, that, maybe that music's too loud. I never know if it's too loud for me or too loud for you. Um, yeah, this is completely free coming out. Yes, it says Xbox, uh, who own it or play via Game Pass. I mean, I, I doubt they're going to release these helicopters just for just for PC if I, if I was to guess I don't know that it says it or not uh, it says more information here um, but they are so later this year I think it's in November right what does it say for the date uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. pretty sure it says November yeah November 2022 there we go so they're going to be releasing yeah what's the 40th anniversary 40th anniversary edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator so Airbus so the A310 so I guess the predecessor to the A320 that we have in the sim is being given away and then all of these so four historical aircraft so these are like tail draggers and historic smaller planes like single seaters stuff like that I don't really fly the historic stuff too much two helicopters two gliders and the A310 so and then, oh yeah, and when they announced this, this was the day they added the Halo Pelican. Like it or not, they put it out the same day they announced the 40th anniversary edition. So yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, I I would say it, there's like a 99% chance all of these are going to be on the Xbox as well. I mean, that's the that's a good thing. I mean, my, Microsoft invested in making this work for the Xbox, and I think we can just assume. You know, I mean, I know. Sometimes it's the third-party planes, I think, that don't get on Xbox immediately because of like they have to be in both marketplaces, essentially. Um, but yeah, I would, I would expect all of the 40th anniversary stuff to be on Xbox. Uh, do I know about the PMDG? I don't. Just because I don't uh, really follow the... I don't really follow the airliners and jets stuff too much. Um, just because, yeah, I'm always sitting inside a smaller plane like this. No, you guys are amazing. Thanks for hanging out. I don't know how late it is for you guys. It's almost 10 p.m. here in California. <laughs> Looks like we got probably another 45 minutes or so to go. We'll see how it goes. But I didn't, I didn't want to not finish this flight. I got to finish this and then eat the latest dinner ever. Uh, where would you be able to get a good Cessna... Um, or A320 checklist. Um, I mean, real life resources are the best, I guess. Um, so if you just look up, you can just look up. Well, first of all, you have the POH. You can just look up the POH for any plane, a real world one. So you can just type in, you know, PA, POH, Cessna 172. I think this, I think the one in the sim is the, it's the Skyhawk. Is it the SP? Um, I forget the exact model. I think it's the 172 SP or something like that. Um, but yeah, the POH will have all of the will have all of the procedures in it. If you want a more like concise checklist, though, I would you know I would just Google it. Or you could go you know the expensive route would be to get something like ForeFlight. ForeFlight has built-in checklists for all the planes. So if if you want to feel like more use something that real pilots use, which is most of them use for flight, especially in general aviation. Um, I don't know as much about the commercial side, but for flight is super popular and they'll have checklists in that. And, you know, you run for flight on, you know, a tablet or a phone. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the cheapest way I would just Google it, look for a checklist. Somebody has probably made some simplified checklist that you can print out. And then lastly, I mean, this should be the best place to do it is in the sim itself but as you can see here mattering which plane you're flying the checklists are different so the grand caravan currently only has these checklists it doesn't have anything after before takeoff so there's no takeoff checklist there's no cruise before descent descent landing parking but if you load up the cessna 172 for example that one has a full set of checklists so I guess what I should say is first check the in-game checklist because they're right at your fingertips. 
but they just vary from plane to plane. Hopefully these are, you know, I assume that they'll be improving these in the future, that they'll be adding, you know, more checklists to each plane going forward. I think it would be great to have a full set of checklists for the Grand Caravan. And third, third party planes as well, a lot of them have pretty thorough checklists. So if you're flying the Kodiak or another marketplace plane, they should have pretty good checklists. I think in general, they're, they're pretty good. Hey Schwartz, what's up? I know you. I know I'm doing a. I'm doing more of a late night stream today, but I'm gonna try to do this more consistently. I think it's. Uh, I don't know. I think it's just a nice thing to do in between. In between the. Uh, the long wait between between videos that I post. Yeah, there's been bots in the channel. I have to keep kicking them out. I think there's just you know there's just bots running on everything. I'm actually surprised that it didn't get caught automatically. But every time it happens, I report it, hide it. It's funny. It's a computer computer attacking the chat room. <laughs> it happens. All right, we have 84 miles left. I still have the ILS 3.1 loaded in. How's our fuel doing? Fuel is good. I think we... Man, it's hardly gone down at all, right? Four hundred pounds per hour is probably high, but I'm just I'm just leaving the throttle uh, pretty maxed out, just not redlining, but close to it, just to get us there as fast as possible. Since this is kind of a long flight, and we're still at holding nineteen thousand feet. Is how's our crosswind? Forty knot crosswind now. I mean, you can see how much we're just crabbed in. Like if you're just looking here at the map. How much we're just crabbed into the into the wind here. Actually, if you look at the uh, if you look from the back, this is the default angle, so you can just see here how much this is our course. You know, right in front of us is the actual course that we're flying, and this is how much we're turned into the wind to compensate for it. Oh, you're in Austria. I'm not sure that I knew that, but I, I guess with a name like Schwartz. You're missing the T, but it's close enough, right? <laughs> unless unless it's spelled without a T in Austria. I think Schwartz is S-E-H-W-R-T-Z, right? Black Wolf? Or maybe you're not trying to use the word Schwartz. My dream is to visit, oh, to visit Austria. I haven't been there myself either. I went to Germany once, pretty briefly. And it was, I just remember it was raining and we didn't have a lot of time there. <laughs> but I did get to practice my crappy German by asking where our room was. <laughs> I'm sure they were, they were laughing as soon as I walked away. <laughs> oh yeah, moto vlogs with your bike since I can't, you have no bike anymore. Oh, you wish you could. Moto vlog. Uh, what kind of, what kind of bikes did you have? I, I rode motorcycles for a bit, um, but I, uh, yeah, I stopped like almost, how many years ago did I stop? I think it was like eight, eight or nine years ago. Um, I had like a, it was my last bike was an R6. I had some crotch rockets. Nowadays I would not, I would not get a, get an R6. I would get something more chill, <laughs> something with a nice posture, just sitting up straight. Yeah, I had a good time. Uh, I had a great time riding motorcycles. Hopefully uh, on the next stream, when I do the next on-air flights, we'll get into some weather. Maybe I should head towards like the Midwest. Um, so if we keep heading northeast, we're, we're passing into South Dakota. Let's bring up Navigraph. This has been turned off for a bit. Um, but we're flying from Wyoming to South Dakota right now. And if we just continue going that direction, we should, I mean, maybe a little more north, turn a little more north, but fly up into the Midwest where I think there's usually a decent amount of weather up there, kind of like flying in the Pacific Northwest. All 
Oh yeah, it's pretty much directly east from here actually. I'm more I'm further north than I thought I was. So yeah, we could just we're gonna continue this. It'd be cool to fly along the border. Maybe we can dip into Canada for a bit and do a few missions over in Canada. That would be pretty cool. And then, yeah, I'd like to make my way. I think what would be really cool is make my way along, like, kind of the northern border here of the U.S. Go all the way up through New England, New Brunswick. And then see if we can make a crossing, cross over into Europe. I guess we would have to go really far north. Um, and I assume we'd have to hop over here. Or there's some islands we can hop to, right? What's the best route? I'm not sure how to do a, what the shortest transatlantic route is. Especially in the northern hemisphere. I guess we just keep going north. Yeah, I assume we'd have to go here up. Can we even go up the coast of Greenland to Iceland and then hop over? I don't know. That, would, that could be cool. I'm, I'm actually interested to see if we could do that. That would be really fun. We get some variety in, uh, in where we're flying because I just fly in the U.S. all the time. And that would actually be cool just because um, I could take advantage of Navigraph. Since Navigraph gives us global charts, gives us global Jeppesen charts, we could fly anywhere in the world. And I just tend to fly in the U.S. all the time. So it would break me out of my shell. Crappy German. <laughs> yeah, my German is like a high school level. A bad high school level. Oh, is it was a two-stroke? Oh. My god, there is life. Alright, one, two, five, decimal one. Alright, we'll acknowledge that. Let's dial it in manually because we're we're not touching any knobs lately. One, two, five, one. There we go. One, two, five, one. Click it over. Contact. Minneapolis Center, Cessna, November, three, five, seven, two, delta flight. Three, five, seven, two, delta. Cessna, November, three, five, seven, two, delta, Minneapolis Center. Continue to Papa India Romeo as planned. Uh, so, oh, you had a 50cc bike. Love to drive it around. That sounds really fun. 65, 70 kilometers per hour. Oh, nice. <laughs> Dude, some of the, uh, like, electric bikes that exist now, like, electric bicycles that exist can go, like, 35, 40 miles an hour, uh, which is crazy. It was a two-stroke. KTM LC4. Let's look up the KTM LC4. See what you're talking about here. Oh, Supermoto. Oh, yeah. But that looks super fun. All right, let's see. Are there many photos here? Sim brief, new tab. Here's the KTM Supermoto. This is what you're eyeballing. Oh, this looks so much fun. And you get it, uh, oh yeah, look, it's already, it's, it's all street legal, right? It's got, it's got the signals. Yeah, you got turn signals. It's got the fender or the, like, what do you call this? Um, where it holds the plate. I know you get rid of those. That's awesome. Yeah, it looks super fun. I'm tempted every now and then to get an electric bicycle for riding around the city, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, what about your next stream? Fly over the Alps of Austria. We could do that. Uh, we could do that just random. Yeah, ran just do some sightseeing. That would be really cool. I know you were talking about wanting a wanting a world update. All right, here we go. We got our top of descent. So we actually have our top of descent right here. Um, they're giving us if we want to use VNAV, we would have to wait four more minutes. Um, we're not going to do that though. We'll just we'll just listen to ATC and be good. We acknowledge descent, descent and maintain nine thousand. So we're just gonna do vertical speed it down. All right, here comes our approach. Yes, it's the ILS. Okay, cab coup, which is not the transition I picked. All right, so we're gonna acknowledge that. Okay, they want us to go all the way down to four thousand. And clear to cab coup. So we have to do cab coup. I picked the wrong transition waypoint. 
All right, all the way down to 4,000. We'll have to remember to change our altimeter once we're on the way down. I'll pull back on our throttle a little bit just to make sure I don't overspeed and ruin the entire flight by breaking the plane. All right, so let's choose. Uh, they cleared us to cab coup, so that means we're gonna activate the approach. So I'm gonna go and select the approach again because I picked the wrong transition point. I prick I picked this one here, uh, brulee. So we're doing cab coup instead. Here's cab coup. Hit enter. And let's do the minimums. I'm gonna use the new radio altimeter minimums. We're gonna set 200 feet. So that's an AGL. We'll have to double check that in a minute. Checking my speed. Okay, we're good. It's got our frequency, 1119er, and then cab coup. So we're gonna go to activate because they cleared us directly to cab coup. So if they did not say cleared to cab coup, then we would not be going direct to cab coup yet. We would wait until they cleared us to, but they did. So we're gonna do activate. The only difference between load and activate is that they both load the procedure into the flight plan. They load the approach in and all the waypoints and all that. If you hit activate, it's just like doing a direct to the transition waypoint. So we're gonna do that. It just saves us another click or two. Okay, and now we had autopilot on, so it's turning us a little bit to the left to get on that new course to go direct to cab coup. And so let's sync this up here. So, oh, that is what I picked here. All right, so I picked I picked cab coup here. Um, and actually let's go ahead and, can we activate that now? I think there's a way to say direct to, how do I do this? Um, what I can do is show the chart right on the map, which is great. And then, oh, add to route. How do I go directly here though? I just wanted to reflect that we started going to this waypoint early. I'm actually not sure how to do that. Clear route. Approach. Yeah, I think maybe maybe we just can't. All right, anyway, what's cool about Navigraph, this is kind of like what ForeFlight will give you if you pay for the like $240 a year version, the middle tier. Um, it'll let you overlay the diagrams right onto the moving map as well. So we don't have to look at this in a separate window. It puts it right on top of our moving map and we see everything right in one spot like this. All right, so let's look at this approach. So final approach course is 313. So that's for runway 31 in Pierre. We're in South Dakota. We're flying the ILS for runway 31. The localizer frequency is up here, 111.9. So it put that in automatically for us. It's tuned in both nav one and nav two. Because we loaded the procedure in the NXI, it automatically put that in for us. Uh, missed approach instructions are here, but just we'll remember to climb to 2400 and then a right turn. So 2400 is what we need to set once we're on final in case we go missed. And we're flying here to cab coup. And then it looks like once we hit this, we're going to fly this arc here at 4000 feet until we hit filter right over here. We're going to continue that left turn onto our final approach course. We'll descend to 3,600 by the time we get to the final approach fix. So that's all here as well. So we see that right here, final approach six, 3,600. And then this little shaded area right here, that shows that represents a localizer. So that's how we line up with the runway. And then uh, this reversal is here. So this is part of, um, if we come in from a different waypoint, this is just giving us information if we need to turn around, but we don't need to do that. Then we have, uh, yeah, brulee is our, it's here, it says it's a final approach fix, see in the NXI, but here in Navigraph, it says the, it's an initial approach fix. Let's see. Okay, it's both, I think. Okay, it's, kind of, it's both the initial and the final approach fix because you can use it as an initial approach fix, but we're not. We're cutting way out here first. All right, and then down here at the bottom, we have our altitudes. So we'll be at 3,600 on our way to Brulee. And then once we hit Brulee, we should capture the glide slope. That's what gives us the vertical guidance down to the runway. And then here we have our minimum. So ILS and just be paranoid and check our speed here. All right, 150, so we're good. Um, so then we have, yeah, our minimums are standard 200 feet AGL. That's a little tiny number in parentheses is AGL. If we use our altimeter, which is based on sea level, that would be 1920. 
Yes, but I um, I put the minimum using our radio altimeter, which we have in the Grand Caravan. So because we have that, we can use the AGL value. We can use 200 feet and use our radio altimeter. That tells us how high we are above the ground. That's not in every plane. It's only in a few. So, you know, like an airliner will have that. Some turboprops will have that. I think the Kodiak does too. Um, I think even like the DA-62 has it. But a smaller plane like a Cessna, like a 172, or like a Piper or a Diamond DA-40, those will not have radio altimeters installed. All right, so yeah, that's that. We're good. So we have everything plugged in. So once we get up here to Cab Coup, we're going to turn right and descend to 4,000 feet. So we'll just keep this in the corner for our reference here. But all this stuff, even if you don't have Navigraph, all this stuff is programmed into the NXI. So we can see these altitudes right here. You can see we're going to 4,000 feet by the time we hit Filta. That's our minimum or our mandatory altitude. Then we go to Brulee. That's the final approach fix. So we'll be going down to 36 then. And we can even see where our top of descent is listed there. And actually, it shows our top of descent there because that's VNAV telling us we need to start our descent at the latest right there. And that's based on giving us this three degree flight path angle or descent angle. We're already descending, so. Um, that actually, that point will keep moving further and further from us since we're already descending. All right, pull back on my throttle a bit more. If we get into that red speed tape, it, Microsoft Flight Sim will potentially just end the game. We'll just we'll just crash basically to lose our flight. So I don't want to do that because we've been flying for so long. That is uh, that's the fun part of uh, doing live streams, I guess. Is that uh, if I mess up, you guys see every little mistake I make. <laughs> Um, so yeah, eventually we'll go down to 3,600 feet. So for now, they told us to go down to 4,000. Now, something I could do, if, I guess I could do this just to show off the VNAV capabilities. I have these in some of my videos, but what you can do instead, right now what we're doing is I'm just having us go down at 900 feet per minute. It's kind of a standard rate of descent for the caravan based on our ground speed. You can go between like 800 and 1,000 feet per minute. It's pretty normal. Um, when we're going like 150 knots. Um, but what we can do, you know, this will just take us down and then it'll stop us when we get to 4,000 feet. VNAV will make it so we get to our target altitude precisely at the point, the waypoint we're supposed to be at that altitude at. So here, remember, we're going down to 4,000 feet and they said to go to 4,000. So we happen to be going down to 4,000 by the time we get to Filta anyway. So because we have permission to go down to 4,000, I have it set for 4,000 already. What I can do is I'm going to make this shallow. I'm just going to stop our descent right now. So we're just, we're just holding level at 11,000 feet right now. Um, what we could do is we could wait until we get to this top of descent marker here. You can see that top of descent will be in four minutes. And this is based on us descending at three degrees. So three degree angle of descent, flight path angle. So if we start descending in four minutes and 13 seconds and we use VNAV, it'll handle this for us and maintain that descent profile of three degrees and get us down to 4,000 feet exactly when we hit this waypoint filter. And we could wait to do it or what I can do is I can do it sooner at a shallower angle so we're not descending so fast. I can do that by using this button right here called VNAV Direct. So they're, they're yelling at us already because we're, uh, cause we're, we stopped descending. Yeah, the altimeter. I am waiting for them to give us the altimeter, but yeah, they haven't done it yet. Yeah, we're still in standard. Yeah, I wish they would have given us the altimeter. Did they give us the altimeter? I don't think they did yet. Yeah, they haven't given us an updated altimeter. Um, what we can do is just quickly check our destination METAR right here to get it. So... Just highlighting this, 2-9-er, 8-9-er. That would be a good idea to set that now. Let's just go ahead and do that. Thanks, Big Mac. Um, so then here, so what, what we can do is use VNAV Direct. So what I'm going to do is let VNAV handle our descent for us instead of guessing or maybe going down faster than I need to. I mean, realistically, you listen to ATC, right? They say to descend and expedite your descent. You just do that. Delta, They're still yelling at us. 
So for VNAV though, if I want to use it, there's a VNAV button up here. Because I've changed my target altitude down already, it's already saying, giving the autopilot permission to go down to 4,000 feet. I can just click VNAV. So it's armed and it's waiting to go. It's ready to go and you can see it here right in white, right? It says V path. So that's where VNAV takes us down based on uh, a vertical path. So instead of waiting for top of descent, what I can do is highlight the waypoint I want to descend to, and then I can just click on VNAV direct and then hit OK. And it's going to recalculate our top of descent. It's going to be right in front of us. So look, it's 12 seconds away now. So now our top of descent is starting already. We just hit it and now VPath is armed. So this is going to follow that calculated descent profile to take us down to hit 4,000 feet. As you can see, bottom of descent right at that waypoint we chose. So what it's done is, remember, we were going to wait until we hit it. Now it would be three degrees for our descent angle, flight path angle. Instead, because we said we want to descend now, it's shallower. It's negative 2.3 degrees. So we're going down more slowly than we would have at three degrees. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how VNAV works. And then we're going to use it again to get down to Brulee. I mean, it's only a 400 foot difference. Um, and actually, in Microsoft Flight Sim, usually you get the vertical guidance for an ILS before the final approach fix. So we probably won't need it again. I mean, but what's really nice about VNAV is, yeah, on a longer descent, um, and you, if you want to descend and hit your target altitude precisely at a waypoint, you can use VNAV for that. And actually, in the beta, um, that I'm, I'm running the beta of Flight Sim, so this is Sim Update 10, you can now do that for any waypoint. So all of these waypoints, we passed them, so I can't show you right now, but they all have an altitude available for them. So you could set a target altitude and use it for VNAV for any waypoint in your flight plan. So even if, say in this case, if I wasn't flying a instrument approach, if I wasn't flying the ILS approach here, what I could do if I'm flying VFR even is I could just do my descent down to pattern altitude by dialing in an altitude for my last waypoint. So my destination would be a waypoint. I could just set the pattern altitude there and then use VNAV to go down to the pattern altitude, which is super cool. All right, so ATC, we'll see if they keep yelling at us, but you know, realistically, if we're playing by the rules, we would just do our descent at a standard rate. Right now we're going at 750. I would have been going at 900 or 1,000 feet per minute instead and getting got down sooner. But this is how VNAV works, so it's, it's really, really awesome. <laughs> Highly recommend it. All right, we're about to make our next turn. You can see it flashing here. One second, it's gonna make a right-hand turn. And we're gonna make our way on this arc out here to go to the, uh, what is it, Filta? To Filta. So keep an eye on my speed. I'll zoom in here more. So you can see here on the chart, we have the approach plate pulled up. So yeah, we're following this very specific DME arc out. And that reminds me of DME. I should have DME turned on while we're flying on an ILS. So here I'll just turn DME on. Uh, it probably says DME required at the top of the approach plate too. Hey, where'd the approach plate go? Approach plate is gone somehow. Let's try to bring it back. Maybe I closed it by accident. All right, there we go. So we're doing this uh, one four, 14 mile DME arc. It says 14 DME arc, oh, from PIR. Um, so we're not, we're not showing DME to PIR. We're showing DME on nav. So actually, if I want to do that, we can double check that it's flying 14 miles from PIR. PIR is 112.5. Let's dial that in on our second nav here. 112.5. So we have the localizer in nav one and we have the VOR over here in nav two. And now what I can do is I want to change my DME to use nav two. So it's on nav one right now. Let's change it to nav two. And it's perfectly 14 nautical miles. So the this is just the NXI is kind of just flexing right now, showing us how how badass it is. So what we're doing is um, this arc we're flying is a 14 mile DME arc 
from PIR. So PIR is this VOR right here. It's actually to the east of the airfield. So what I did was I tuned NAV2 radio or NAV2 into PIR instead of the localizer. NAV1 is on the localizer. That's going to give us guidance to the runway. Um, and then I just configured it. So our DME uh, little bug here or overlay here shows is using NAV2. And you can see right there, it's exactly 14.0 nautical miles from PIR. So it's flying this arc very precisely. So you can see we're doing this DME arc um, as part of this uh, this procedure, but you know, it's it's just cake because the NXI and the autopilot's doing all the work for us. But it's just how we can verify it. And when you fly an ILS, you can see up here at the top, it'll say somewhere. I usually look at the FAA charts, but it'll it'll say DME required. Yeah, right here, number one, it says it's pretty small. You guys can't read this probably, but it says use the IPIR DME when on the localizer course. Um, okay, so that's telling us once we're on the fi on final, we should be using the DME to the localizer. But then down here, you can see this one says 14 mile DME arc to PIR, not IPIR. IPIR is the localizer. PIR is the VOR that's over here. And then where does it say DME required? Maybe it's not required. Usually at the top, especially on an FAA chart, it'll say DME required. Uh, for an ILS approach. Anyway, it's probably just a difference with the Jeppesen chart that I'm not quite used to. So I mostly use the FAA charts. I mean, it's just, it's so perfect. I mean, we have, the precision we have right now is amazing. I mean, we ha we're using VNAV to precisely get down perfectly to the altitude we need to be at, at the waypoint we need to be at. We have our DME uh, here showing that it's perfectly flying this 14 mile arc from the local or from the VOR that's off the field. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I just need to not mess the rest of it up. Um, and then our, let's see our missed approach altitude, just to remind myself it's climbing, climbing to 2,400 feet. So I'll want to set that once we're coming down on the ILS. Uh, once we have the glide slope, we have vertical guidance. Yeah, that DME feature is awesome. Hey, Loris, how's it going? Sorry, you sent that message a while ago. Uh, I feel like I learned something new about NXI every time I watch one of your videos. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, it could be that I just learned it as well, and that's why I'm talking about it. But <laughs> All right, in this case, it's not true, but I actually don't. Um, I don't have a good habit of turning on DME, and I know that for real life flying, you know, this is really important stuff. Like, this is stuff that you have to follow when you're doing IFR, when you're doing... Uh, instrument uh, procedures so it's a little advanced for me but I'm trying to get into the habit of treating it a little more realistically even though we're not using VATSIM yet alright so you see we're finishing the arc once we're done with this we're going to make another left hand turn and you can see this altitude called out right here it says 3600 and then there's also a number there it says 9.4 so that's going to be referring to our distance and that's going to be the DME distance from the localizer. So DME is different than our GPS distance because GPS distance does not account for the angle that we point down to it. So if we take our finger and point down at the ground, actually at the ground, that distance is gonna be different than the distance it would say if we were just floating above it at 10,000 feet at that same point on the map. So DME, it's line of sight basically, it's the, it's, it's, as if we draw a line from us directly down to the equipment. So that measurement will be different than the GPS measurement to that waypoint. Because the GPS measurement, it, it is only based on the ground measurement, basically. So it, it doesn't take into account our current altitude. So because we're higher up, that distance will be longer than as if we were on the ground and then going straight to that waypoint. So we're going to make this left-hand turn, and then this is where it's telling us, um, it said in the notes up here, to use the localizer's DME when we're on course. So once we make this turn, I'm going to switch it over. Instead of using NAV2, we're going to switch to NAV1. NAV2 is using, remember, the, the uh, VOR up here off the course, uh, off of the field. Does the approach... Hey, William, what's up? Um, oh, good night, Chris. Thanks for hanging out, dude. Thanks, Loris. 
I'm, tr I'm going to try to do them more often, especially like in the evening during the week for a couple hours. So, all right, we're getting ATC. And we're about to make our left hand turn. There we go. Okay, so we're just going to acknowledge that, I guess. So what we need to do now is, remember, we have to drop down 400 more feet. So first of all, let's get that set up. Our altitude first. We're going to go down to 3,600. And it's about to switch. Watch, this is going to change from magenta to green in just a second because we're on an ILS. It's going to change to use the localizer automatically for us when we're completing this turn. And now I'm going to switch to vertical speed mode. And we're going to get down to 3,600 feet. All right, still completing this turn. Uh, William, to answer your question, no, you don't have to use Navigraph. Um, this, I'm not using the Navigraph data, actually. I'm using the stock flight sim data. All right, there's the switchover. So what it did was it basically hit this CDI button automatically for us to switch us over from GPS to using the localizer. So now it's using the localizer to precisely line us up with the runway. All right, I'm going to slow down a little bit more. You can see the runway lights. You can see the kind of approach lighting system right out there. All right, so what we're going to do now, remember, we need to change our DME from nav one to, or from nav two back to nav one. At this point, we're supposed to be using the DME from the localizer. So we're going to click here again, go down to DME and change it back to nav one. Now you can see a change here, right? So on nav two, it's 11 nautical miles to the VOR we had, but on nav one, this is to the localizer, 13.8 nautical miles. All right, so it said it said 9.4 right there, so that should be nine. I think that's 9.4 DME to the next waypoint. Actually, I thought maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought that 9.4 was actually going to be how far away in DME miles we were from the localizer, but it doesn't look to be the case because we're 12.9 miles from it. So, all right, um, the last thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to hit approach. Well, not the last thing, but I'm going to hit approach mode up here on the autopilot, clicking APR. What that does is it gets us ready to intercept the glide path. So the localizer is our horizontal guidance, our lateral guidance. This lines us up perfectly with the runway. So we're lined up with the runway. The glide slope is going to come down right here. This is the vertical guidance. You can see it's over our head right now. So we're going to stay at this altitude. We're where we're supposed to be. We're at 3,600 feet. Once we get closer, this is going to come down. Just picture it as a laser beam coming from the airport. And we need to, it's like a tractor beam. We're flying under the tractor beam right now. But once we get closer, we're going to basically bump our head on it and get sucked in by the tractor beam down to the runway. That's our vertical guidance. Now, if you're flying an RNAV approach or something like that, like an LPV approach, it's an RNAV approach. That one, the LPV is similar to an ILS. You get vertical guidance on that. So it's similar. It's just called a glide path instead of a glide slope. On the ILS, it's called a glide slope. We can also see here... This is new in the next NXI update or the, you know, the beta that I'm running. This is 1900 feet RA. That's radio altimeter or radar altimeter. You could say either one, but this is our height above the ground right now, not our height above seat level. So we can see our height above sea level is 3,600 feet. Our height above the ground is 2000 feet. And that's going to change as the terrain's changing underneath us. So, you know, as a mountain comes up or something, that's number is going to decrease because relative to the mountain, we're, you know, lower. All right, and I'm, I'm already a little bit slow, but I'm already in flap range, but I could be going a little faster now since we have we have a little time. Um, so now that um, what now what I'm going to do soon, as soon as we're on the glide slope, I'm going to change our bugged altitude here, our selected altitude to our our missed approach altitude. So if we if we have to execute a miss, you can see here it says climb to 2400 feet. So as soon as we're on the glide slope, we don't need that altitude bug anymore. We're in the tractor beam and it's pulling us down. We don't need to worry that if we change this, something else will change. It won't because we're not using altitude mode anymore. Here comes the glide slope. We're about to get pulled in by the tractor beam. There it is. GS is highlighting now. It's activating. Okay, so now you can see our vertical mode is GS. So it's following the glide slope. That's what approach mode does on the autopilot. So now that that is good, I don't need to worry about changing my altitude bug now. I can change this to our missed approached altitude right here, which is 2400. So I'm just going to set it to 2400. And then I'm also going to sync our heading bug straight ahead because we need to fly runway heading if we go missed. 
It's a good practice to sync your heading bug kind of all the time, like after every turn, just in case you need to use heading mode on your autopilot. All right, so we're good. I'm going to slow down a bit more and get my flaps out. Uh, both VPath and GS armed, yeah. So I had VPath armed because it would have... Um, we, we had already descended, so I didn't I didn't turn VPath off. We were using it before. We were using VNAP before. Um, I can I can I can talk you through that in a minute, but I'm gonna do the landing first. All right, so we're in flap range now, so I'll just get my first one down. And I'll need to add a little bit of throttle, probably, because it'll slow us down quite a bit. All that extra drag. Now remember, our minimum on this is 200 feet AGL. We can see that right here. And it, we're using AGL because we have the radio altimeter in the Grand Caravan. So we're at 1,300 feet, so we've got 1,200 feet to go until we're at our minimums. So with our minimums, that means if this was completely cloud-covered, overcast, raining, we couldn't see anything at all, we could keep flying on this approach until we're at our minimum. Or it's, in this case, it's a decision altitude. And then we would uh, decide whether we're going missed or not based on whether we can see the runway environment. In this case, on a clear day, you know, we see it clear as day. Obviously, it's, we have this whole lighting system in front of us. Um, so we're good to go. But on a cloudy day, that's what mist gives us. If we're, if we're not established to land and we can't and we could, couldn't if we couldn't see the runway or we're not going to make the landing, we would go approached um, at or above that minimum of 200 feet. All right, we're at 800 AGL. So we'll get down to 200 AGL. What's the wind looking like? Eight knots slightly from the right. I'll put our last notch of flaps in. I probably don't need it, but I'll just do it anyway. I think some real life pilots were telling me that like often a lot of them don't even land with full flaps or sometimes no flaps. And I'm sure it depends on the conditions and stuff and the plane you're flying, but all right. So we're at 520 feet. We can still go 300 more feet down before we, before we need a visual of the runway lighting system, the edge lighting system, the threshold, there's a whole list of criteria for what you need to see to count it as seeing the runway environment. And it matters the lighting system at the, at the runway you're landing at. All right, we're at 260 feet, 250. It doesn't call out the minimums yet. That's something maybe we'll see in the future, but we're about to hit it. All right, that's minimums right there. So we're good. We're going to continue. We can obviously see the runway. Now we have a little bit of a crosswind out of the right, so I need to... I need to turn it into that wind. All right. Some birds there. All right. Left rudder. Woo. It's always surprising when the nose wheel comes down and you're like pushing in a direction. All right. That was pretty good. All right, let's go and find our taxi. You know, I just realized that ATC, um, ATC just stopped talking to us that whole time, by the way. Did they even give us, uh, I mean, they cleared us for the approach. Expedite our descent is the last thing they said. Yeah, they didn't contact us at all after that. Normally, they'll uh, ask you to get if you have the airport in sight or not, if it's an untowered airport, or they'll pass you off to the tower controller if it's a towered airport, but none of that happened. I'm not sure if it's because of a bug or what, but um, yeah, it was a little a little silent at the end there. You can see our only option is to report that we went missed to that controller, even though they're they're um, like a center controller, not they're not a tower controller at this airport. All right, let's put our taxi lights on. Oh no, I made a mistake. My landing lights were off during landing. Probably get dinged for that. All right, flaps are going up. We're going to stop here. Okay, that's all good. Uh, William says, is an ILS precise enough um, to take you all the way to the ground without taking manual control? I mean... You could try it, but I, I don't I don't think you are allowed to. The only I think ILS, the only ILS capabilities that do that I think that I know of in real life I think is a Cat Three ILS. We basically just flew a Cat One ILS. Um, a Cat Three ILS I, I think is the one that's like an auto landing system, and they can go down to like I don't even know what the minimum is. 
Um, I think some, I, I think Cat 2 can take you down to maybe 100 feet AGL before you have to take manual control. And then I believe Cat 3 is the auto landing. I don't really fly the airliners, so somebody in chat probably knows <laughs> knows about it. But I'm pretty sure Cat 3 is the is like an auto landing system where some like really tech advanced planes out there um, can do a full auto land with an ILS Cat 3, I think it is. All right, let's move our flight condition back to low idle and we'll turn off our nav light and all right, our taxi light is on. So let's see, I don't think, yeah, this is not a towered airport. So we'll just turn on traffic. Kilo Papa India Romeo, traffic and now it's clear of runway and we'll go to parking and shut off so we can get paid. So we were doing an on air, uh, on air mission here. Like there's not even, um, we can't even announce that we are going to parking, which is a little weird too. All right, and then let's see if we have a taxiway diagram just to show it here. Open charts lists, taxi. There we go, load this. We got our nice taxiway diagram. And of course, you can use the one on the NXI too. So if I zoom in far enough, we'll get a little airport diagram here as well. But it doesn't give you the labels. So, you know, something like Navigraph is essential if you're going to do VATSIM or something like that, because they're going to give you uh, taxi instructions that you actually need to write down and actually follow correctly. Unlike in, you know, using the ATC, you can just kind of break all the rules and it's fine. Or, you know, it's fine if you're fine with it. <laughs> But yeah, having Navigraph or Four Flight with moving maps, you have to pay for an upgrade on Four Flight to get the the geo located plates like this. So if you only have the basic Four Flight, when you look at this chart, or you actually look at the FAA version, because the Jefferson charts are really expensive, but it'll show you the chart, but you won't see your little plane icon on it unless you pay for the middle tier or higher. So they'll basically there are three tiers for Four Flight. The cheapest one you won't get that capability. The second one you will, I think it's $240 a year now, so it can get very pricey, but it's also pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, we're just going to pick any parking spot we want, really. Just try to find one next to... Oh, here we go. Here's our guy. All right, there we go. All right, lights off. Now, I made this mistake last time. I had lights on when we turned the engine off and ended the flight, and they yelled at me and on air for it. So uh, let's see here. Let's turn. Oh, wait, how are those on? Oh, there we go. Okay, that's off. Strobe is off. Beacon is on, but oh, yeah, beacon should still be on until the engines are totally stopped. So we'll do the cutoff. And then we'll shut off the fuel. I think this is a shut off too down here, right? Yeah, there's fuel shut off down there. All right, now on air should give us credit. And turn off our avionics and our battery, get credit in flight sim. So it actually gave us, yeah, it gave us full credit for the full two flights we did. So um, yeah, and it has both of the landings too. So this is something that's not only cool for like, you know, VAT sim or whatever, but we did two completely different, two, two legs. We did two flights, but we did not go back to the world map and we never programmed anything into the world map. So that's the really cool thing about this update coming out with the, at least, you know, anyone that's not using Microsoft Flight Sim ATC, they're not really worried about this because they haven't been filing their IFR flight plans, like doing the clearance through Microsoft Flight Sim ATC. But for those of us that have, that do use the in-game ATC, like I do, this is great because I like getting the approach assigned to me. That part of it's fun because I'm not using VATSIM. So I like the randomness of it assigning an approach to me. And then I have to react to it, program the approach, brief the approach plate, all that stuff. Um, anyway, so that's the cool part about this update is you can just program in a new flight plan, get a new IFR flight clearance if you're flying IFR, um, and then just continue on to your next leg. So we did, you know, an hour 53 of actual flight time. 
Uh, and that's how long has that taken us? On the actual stream, we're at what is it? Three hours? It looks like. Yeah, three hours and ten minutes or so. But we got a good, you know, almost two hours of flight time in there. Um, so yeah, so that's you know that's the update I'm most excited about. Honestly, is the flight sim ATC working with the Navigraph uh, flight plans, or sorry, the uh, working with the NXI flight plans. Hey, McGuire, how's it going? Uh, okay, so Nyctus says, or Nyctus says, category three A and B. So yeah, it's a category three ILS approach, and I guess yeah, mattering the capability of the plane, it it could potentially fly that, and I'm sure there's crew requirements and all that um, associated with flying a category three. But on those, there are auto landing. I think um, some of the airliners, like maybe it's the PMDG or the Phoenix. Um, I think some of them support the auto landing in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I don't fly the airliner, so I don't know. Uh, but you could always, you know, Google it or hit up the Microsoft Flight Sim official forums or their Discord channel. Um, and I'm sure you could uh, find information on it. But yeah, I th I'm pretty sure there is an auto land that works in some of the those higher end, more study level airliners that are available. Uh, yeah, I just finished. I just started. Sorry, McGuire, but you can go back and watch it. I, obviously, I can't chat with you if you watch the uh, recording, but yeah, if you want to see what happened this flight, we did two legs um, for on-air companies. So this is my on-air career. should check to see what do we earn here. So reputation went up, so that's good overall. I know this is really tiny on the stream, but um, it says my reputation went up 0.27%. Um, we got a comfort bonus obtained, so that's just for flying smoothly. I didn't get that last time, I don't think, for the first flight. Did not get the safety bonus. It says because my engine was on when I started tracking the flight. So I always make that mistake. It it expects you to be completely turned off uh, when you uh, start the flight. Otherwise, it penalizes you. And then we got the aircraft handling bonus. So that's just if you don't, you know, not too many excessive Gs or um, banks or anything like that. All right, so that looks good. And we earned... Uh, 1100 bucks, had 1100 credits, and some XP. Hello, Mountain. The Mountain is my dog, for those that don't know. <laughs> I subscribed. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just starting to do this. I numbered, I numbered the stream 001 intentionally to try to uh, make this a regular thing. So, um, I just want to continue my on-air career using this career mod. You know, I, I do this off stream a lot. I'll fly. I flew one last night, but I figured it'd be good to do something more regular um, for you guys that just like to hang out and do a couple flights together. Um, so I'll probably be on in a few more days. I uh, hope to do this. I think I'm going to aim for once or twice a week, probably probably more more often twice a week if I can. Um, but it, it, they'll, they will be mostly in the evenings during the week since I work full time. So it'll be after I'm done with work at night, California time. All right, cool. That was cool. We did, we did two flights. Um, we did, we did one visual and hand landed the whole thing, did a missed approach. Cause I, I was too high on my first approach, the first flight. And then the second flight we did the ILS, uh, ATC was a little weird. Um, I think it's really just because we're, we're flying to a lot of untowered airports here. So you know, we've, we're in the, yeah, this one's also untowered, as we can see. So I think maybe ATC is just, maybe there are a few bugs with it when you're going to an untowered airport. Usually it just asks if you, um, it just asks us if you have the uh, field in sight. It didn't even ask that this time, so it was a little weird. Um, do I have a VA? I do. Um, when I first made it, I called it Hops, H-O-P-S, because I thought it was funny, because I like beer. So it's Hops. Um, but I changed the name to on the ground, but, um, yeah, hops is my company. It's just me you can see. It's just one employee. I just kind of fly on my own. Um, but yeah, if you guys, if you guys don't have one and we want to do one together, I think that's fine, but I don't know that all the time to manage it. Um, so yeah, I think we'd have to, we'd have to figure it out. Maybe we could chat about it on discord or something, but, um, I don't even know if it's public, if you can just join any of them. Um, cause I just kind of do it on my own, but I think, I think we should do that if there's enough people that use on air and we want to have a little company together, that could be fun. But if we did, I would have it as, uh, as lax as possible, like no requirements basically, <laughs> like just so it can be as casual as possible. Um, 
But yeah, it'd be cool to chat about it. If you want to hop in the Discord, Aaron, or you can wait till the next stream if you want to. But until then, if you want to hop in the Discord, you can. It's uh, linked in the description as well. But I don't know if it'll be have enough activity for you to be happy as being part of it, you know, because I I'm just doing it pretty rarely. Um, but yeah, maybe it is. Uh, is Google Maps available on Xbox Series X? No, it's not just because it's a it's a PC mod. I used it for a little bit and it was um, I it was nice, but it was kind of janky like it. It loaded the maps in the satellite images in. You could see them loading in as you're flying in the distance, so it wasn't very um, wasn't very elegant, but it did look good. Um, but it's only for PC. Anything for Xbox, you know, because you can't install whatever you want onto an Xbox for the most part. It has to be in the marketplace in the sim for it to be available there. So, and then um, I'm not sure if William is still around, but he had asked why I had VPath and GS armed. So I was using VNav at first. Oh, C Wiggins, you would join too. All right, I think. I mean, we could if there's enough people. We just need to. We need to help each other out, and manage it because I don't know how on it I will be <laughs> managing it. Um, so William was asking why I had VNAV armed. Um, so VNAV is a way to do descents. So I was using VNAV to handle our descent down to hit a certain altitude at a certain waypoint precisely. And when you're coming in for an instrument approach, usually you'll have to descend a bit more um, after you turn onto the final approach course. Usually you'll still descend a bit to get down to the altitude to intercept the vertical guidance. So in this case, we did an ILS. And so what we were doing is waiting, we were waiting to descend to be at the right altitude at the right time to intercept the glide slope to get our vertical guidance down to the runway. Now that descent, when we were descending down to that waypoint, the final approach fix, you can do that however you want. You can hand fly it down to that altitude. You can use vertical speed mode on the autopilot. Or what I was doing is using VNAV on the autopilot. That's another way to descend. Um, just a little more precise than something like vertical speed mode. So typically, um, typically I'll use vertical, I'll use VNAV to do all of my descent for the approach until I get the vertical guidance, and then that'll take over. So at one point I had VPath armed, which is VNAV, and I had GS also armed, which is the approach mode. So basically, GS will supersede VNAV. It'll take priority over it. So if the VNAV was controlling our descent first and it was active, then the um, approach mode, so GS, it would get captured on top of it. So, um, but what I actually did was I used vertical speed mode instead of using VPath. But um, it, yeah, it might've looked like super busy on the enunciations there when it, it probably said like VNAV, VPath, or probably said VS, VPath, GS all together. <laughs> um, but I ended up not using VPath. And that it also might be a bug. When I click VS, it probably should have taken VPath off the enunciation for the autopilot. It probably should have just said VS, GP, or GS in our case for glide slope. Um, but yeah, it could be a bug. And uh, yeah, if it is, then uh, maybe I should I should take note and report that to the to the NXI developers. All right, cool. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Uh, I'm going to end this stream. It's been, uh, we got a good three hours and 20 minutes on a Wednesday evening. So I'm going to try to keep this going if you guys like it. Um, seems like we had enough people here following along that it was good. So I'll plan on doing at least another one. Um, unless people are like, these are lame and people stop watching them. Uh, maybe they'll fade off <laughs> in time. But for now, I'll plan on doing another one in a few days. Do another uh, on-air couple more on-air missions heading towards the uh, Midwest this time. So we'll keep heading eastbound in the U.S. Uh, William says, is it just the beta of the NXI that will auto switch? No, the current the current version will do that. Um, the features that are in the beta for the sim update that comes out next month, or you can get the beta now if you want it early. The main features are the air traffic control synchronization stuff that I showed where if you use in-game ATC, it'll synchronize with your flight plan changes. So we did that during this stream. I did two flights, programming it in manually each time, getting our IFR clearance through ATC. If you don't care about ATC, then that won't affect you much. The other features are um, with VNAV that I was just talking about, you can actually 
designate any waypoint to uh, to use VNAV. So you can do that um, on any waypoint. That's an update. Right now, you can't do that. You can't modify any VNAV altitude yourself in the current version, only in the beta. Uh, and then also radio altimeter support and weather radar support. The Grand Caravan has its own onboard weather radar right here. This little, this little thing sticking out here. This is an actual uh, weather radar um, piece of equipment that's on this plane. So that is also um, in the beta. So if your plane has one, you can get those like sweeping weather radar uh, screens. You can pull those up too. Um, I am working on a, a concise video to summarize all that stuff. Um, I was working on that a little earlier, probably work on that for a few more days. So you could expect to see that this weekend or maybe early next week, I'll have that video out, not on the stream, but just as a regular video to summarize all that stuff. But I personally have had a really good experience with the beta so far. So I think, um, I would recommend it cause you can always roll it back to the regular version if you don't like it, but it's been actually pretty extremely stable for me. Um, but you know, everybody's um, everybody's experience is a little different, so take it with a it's a it's a little risk to use a beta always. So, um, but for me, it's been great. All right, I'm actually gonna go now. I'm gonna eat the latest dinner in the world and then pass out. And uh, I'll see you guys in a couple days probably. And if you want to hop on the Discord, it's linked in the description. So if you I don't know, there's a there's a good amount of us that chill out in there and just chat uh, here and there. So yeah, feel free to join if you want to. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you all uh, on the next stream. Have a good night or day wherever you are. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Have a good one.